Okay. So I think we're ready to go, Sarah. We're ready. Hi, welcome to the March 2nd, 2021 joint meeting of the Concord Carlisle and Concord School Committees. This meeting is being recorded. Uh, I'd like to call to order the Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee with the roll call vote after court opens up the Concord School Committee. Thank you very much. And uh, with the Concord Public Schools School Committee will come to order. Uh, for our regular meeting. And roll call. Anderson present. Booth present. Bout present. Maestad present. Mustafi present. Rainy here. Wilson present. Uh, great. Can we have a motion to enter executive session with a plan to return to open session at 6 p.m.? Move that the Concord School Committee and the Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee will enter into executive session under purpose two of the open meeting law to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. And purpose three of the open meeting law to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation regarding termination of the EDCO Collaborative and the case of uh, IYB Kester Kruger, CCTV Inc., Town of Concord, and Concord Carlisle Regional School District. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and return to open session at 6 p.m. Second. Second for both committees. Discussion. Roll call. Anderson, I for both. Booth, I for both. Out, I for both. Raised that, I for both. Mustafi, I for region. Brady, I for both. And Wilson for region. See you back here at six. Very good, thank you. Okay. Are we all back in the room now? Alexa, Heather, Court, Cynthia, Eva. Uh, I see Fatima. Seven, there we go. Okay. Ah, hi. Okay, so welcome back to the open session of the Concord Carlisle and Concord uh, School Committee's March 2nd meeting. As previously noted, we are being recorded. Um, when I do not see our high school representative. Yes, Amy's here. Amy's here. Oh, welcome, Amy. Thank you. I'm we both look at there as well. Yeah. Furious. So a, a few couple of notes about our agenda. Um, one is that last week we had mentioned that this week we would be discussing the creation of a new position in the district that would help us with reaching our cultural competency goals. And while this was originally on the agenda, Court and I felt that the issue needed a little more time to give it the full attention it deserves. And so we wanna do this right and we'll be discussing it at next week's meeting. If you're here to speak about it, we still welcome public comments, but just wanna be clear about any confusion about it being on the agenda. Um, also noted last week, that at next week's meeting, uh, Dr. Hunter will be bringing forward recommendations, information, and proposals about uh, in-school learning expansion. And um, we'll get to that in a little bit. And one more change to tonight's agenda is that we are very fortunate to have our student representatives with us. And so I'd love to begin with their updates, if that's OK with them. Yeah, so um, it definitely, even though it's a little cold, it's starting to feel more like spring and the end is definitely in sight. 
And pretty soon it'll be the anniversary of when school and everything shut down, which is just crazy to think about. I remember when I was in, when the school was originally starting, I feel like everyone around me is like, we're not going to make it until November. Well, here we are in March. So congratulations to all y'all on your hard work. Cause here we are, we're still going strong. And um, I think March has always been that really long stretch because you have February break and you have April break, but then there's just this long month of March in between. So, you know, students are just still chugging along. I think seniors are kind of waiting for the workload to just be released off their shoulders because a lot of us are not really willing to stay here for much longer. But um, in other news, fall two had also recently started the fall two season and it's a little strange to have football going on in March, but I'm sure that all the athletes are just excited that they're still able to have a season because especially for seniors, you don't want to not have a senior season. Yeah, and from, from Nom Sports things, uh, the fall radio play just started up. We're doing some episodes of the Twilight Zone, which is pretty cool because I think that's not a very like typical play to put on with a school. Uh, we're doing three episodes. We're doing, uh, if you don't, I'm not sure if you know all of them, but they're on Netflix right now. We're doing Monsters We Do on Maple Street, The Shelter, and The Hitchhiker. And so now we're just like, practicing and getting it ready to be aired live on the radio in April. And I think that's basically it. Yeah, that's pretty much all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Stick around for a moment, if you would, Linda and Amy, because we, we did have something else come in from the high school today, which you probably already know about. So I think this would fit uh, Sarah under under high school news. Um, the principal uh, uh, asked that we might share this, and I'll, I'll paraphrase a little bit. Uh, a piece of correspondence that came from uh, Julia Zapoli. Do I pronounce her last name correctly? Uh, she founded Caring for the Frontlines, Concord and Carlisle, uh, to show appreciation for the town's frontline workers. Uh, she raised, I'm sure uh, with her leadership, but probably help of others, she raised $6,500 and thanked over 850 essential workers. Uh, and she's got uh, pictures uh, to, to share with any interested people. And I'll quote now exactly from her, her letter. Now it is my goal to thank every CCHS employee for their essential work throughout the pandemic. I am extremely grateful to all of my teachers, exclamation point. In addition to the teachers, CCHS would not have been so successful in their reopening plans without the teamwork of the administration, the teachers, the tutors, the nurses, the maintenance staff, and every other employee in the building. Your continued hard work has kept the schools open. Your hard work has not gone unnoticed, and I would like to recognize you all for it. That being said, I have decided to dedicate the next appreciation to effort to CCHS. And then she continues on uh, that uh, there will be a food truck, part of her uh, program, a food truck coming to the high school for uh, the many people she wants to thank on Thursday, March 18th. So I think we uh, want to uh, give a shout out, and I know Amy and Linda will join us, uh, to Julia uh, in particular, but also to what Julia represents, which is all of these students and all of the staff and faculty who have, as you said, Linda, uh, worked through this for now going on a year with, uh, with extraordinary resilience, uh, with, with uh, gestures of kindness for each other, with a, with a lot of patience, um, when necessary, even some forgiveness for all the, uh, the challenges that have been thrown, thrown their way. Uh, so um, we wanted to fit that in also here as part of high school news and say uh, we think she's a, a superb representative of a superb group of students uh, who are doing so much to recognize the faculty and staff who have been there every day to support them. So thank you, Amy. Thank you, Linda. And thank you, Julia. Thank you all. Thank you all. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so as mentioned, uh, next week there will be more robust information about uh, continuing plans for um, expanding in-school learning. But I believe that Dr. Hunter would like to share um, I'd like to address the audience on this topic before we get underway. Laurie, you're on mute. 
Thank you. Uh, we thought it would make sense knowing that uh, there's likely people attending with a lot of interest in what's happening with our plan for expanding in-person learning time. So I thought it just would be helpful to give a very, you know, one minute highlight of where that work is at. Um, it is active and ongoing across all of the schools. Um, we are very much, I believe, ready to say uh, the first week in April that we will be able to uh, have the elementary kids stay all day. Um, we've got a lot of pieces that are still coming together and a lot of details to work out. And I, I'll just stress the reason for that. We're complying with the governor's order of last week um, that was very direct and was made clear to me from the state that that is the expectation. Um, so we are working on that and do expect that that's a, that's a goal we will be able to meet. Um, middle and high school is a lot more complicated and complex. We are very much working on all of those moving pieces as well. The goal is to expand as much as we possibly can. Um, because it's on the school committee agenda for the 9th, uh, the goal is that you know no later than Friday or into the weekend, if I absolutely need it, um, to be able to outline our status uh, for the Tuesday meeting of next week. Again, the goal is to bring, bring kids back in and have them um, in as often and as much as possible. It's just a, little, a lot more layers there. You know, elementary, we're, we, we already had them all in half day. Expanding is a different starting point than uh, mixing the hybrid piece together and, you know, really looking at all the logistics that have to go into that and to make it work and maintain the safety protocols that we, you know, come to feel necessary. Um, I will encourage parents on the call. We sent a survey today. Um, that's a way for us to get aggregate feedback uh, at a very high level. There'll certainly be more detailed surveys likely to come. So please get that back to us Friday. That um, will not necessarily make the decisions for us, but will highly inform the decisions in terms of some of the moving pieces um, and what your needs and hopes are um, as we consider this last third of the school year. Great. Just thank a big you. thank you. The everyone's working really hard right now on this, and I just can't say enough for the energy and efforts going on across the entire entire districts, both of them. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. You're welcome. Uh, and with that, I think we can begin public comment. A few things to note. If it's your first time here uh, to put yourself in queue, please raise your hand through the participants tab. Uh, there's a little button that says raise hand. Um, and we will take uh, people in the order in which they uh, raise their hands. Though we do ask if you have spoken before, I see there are a lot of, a lot of new names, a lot of familiar names. Um, if you've spoken before, Please try to give new participants an opportunity to be heard. Uh, we will listen to everybody. We don't have a fixed amount of time, right? Other than that everybody gets three minutes. Um, try to give you a 30 second warning. Um, please try to bring up new ideas, new concerns, new questions. If someone's already said what you wanted to say, note that we, we have heard, right? We are listening, we are taking notes and and we are paying attention. Um, and uh, and the last thing, as always, school committee meetings are meetings in the public, not with the public. This is a chance for you to raise your uh, voices, your opinions, your concerns, your ideas. Um, we all we want to hear it all, uh, but we typically do not engage in a dialogue during the public comment. Um, so with that. I think that's it, Court, right? And we can... Uh, and just that we want people, when you recognize them, Sarah, to uh, give us a uh, name and address, please. Yes, yes. And just a reminder again that this meeting is being recorded. So with that, Kristen Piper. Hi, thank you. Um, my name's Kristen Piper. I live at 30 Oak Road. Um, I want to start by thanking all of you for everything you're doing. And Dr. Hunter, thank you for the survey today. That was great to see. And I filled it out from all my kids. And um, one of the questions was about things that have gone well this year. And I put some stuff in, but I, I forgot to put in one little highlight that I thought I'd start with. And that is I have a sophomore and she was able to complete the lifeguarding mm -hmm. gym course. And 
somehow they figured out how to get those kids into BD Center and get them in the pool and do the COVID safe CPR on the dummy. And she's learned her CPR. She's got her lifeguarding certification. And I just think that's fabulous. So kudos to the high school for making that happen. Um, I am in support of more in school learning for our middle and high school. And as, as you look forward to that, and as we move towards that, I would just encourage us to remember that one of the huge reasons hybrid has been so hard is because it's just so hard to learn on the Zoom calls. And I have kids that are in, in normal times, pretty functional students, and they're telling me and their friends are telling me, mom, I'm trying, I'm trying to pay attention. I'm trying my best. I just can't get it when I'm on the Zoom. So my worry is that we're gonna consider bringing them back into the building to sort of check that box, but they might be like in the corner of the cafeteria with headphones in a mask on the same Zoom that they might've been at home without a mask in their bedroom, and it might not change that learning ability. So what I, wanna, what I hope that you guys are discussing is not just in the building, but with their teachers. And I think that that face-to-face -face or mask-to-mask, -mask, whatever you want to call it, impact of teacher directly looking at the student saying, are you with me? Do you have this? Can we move forward? Is like, we just can't put enough value on that. Um, I'm not even going to address all the social, emotional, loneliness, depression, all that stuff, which is like really kind of exploding now that we're a year into this. But really, this comment is just about the academics. I hope they can be in the room. I don't know if that's 18 kids or 22 kids or however you're going to do it. But that's that's my hope, that it's not just in the building, but it's literally with their educators. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have any other comments? Uh, yes, Carrie Ann Stone. Hi, Carrie Ann. Hi. Can you hear me and see me? Yes. Yes. And uh, name and address, please. Great. I'm Carrie Ann Stone, and I live on Wright Road in Concord. Um, I also just want to start by expressing my appreciation. Um, I think, you know, we are in an incredibly privileged community, and we've had the privilege during this really difficult year of having the hybrid models. We've had in person learning um, since the fall, and I, I absolutely understand and appreciate how amazing that is. Um, we all know it's been almost a year since our schools closed, and it's been just an incredibly difficult one for, for so many people. Um, you know, as we all know, we learn, we know a lot more about the COVID virus now than we did. Um, and I think that we also are understanding a lot more about the crisis that's facing our youth. Um, and you know the critical importance that this that in-person learning and in-person interaction has um, for our children and our youth. Uh, and you know I've really seen that that this effect has been cumulative. Um, both you know kids that were faring okay in the fall are really starting to decompensate. I've seen it in my own children. I'm a parent of three um, at middle school and high school. And then I've seen it um, as in my other role as a pediatrician. So I spend, I've spend i spent the better part of a year speaking to children from varied communities um, and understanding how the different models have impacted them and impacting them negatively. I know there are exceptions to this, um, but that has been the overwhelming sentiment. And I think we're understanding that better as a society. Um, I am absolutely in support of advancing in-person edu education now um, within our district. And I'm really encouraged to see that these discussions are happening now. Um, for me as an outside observer, um, it feels like it hasn't necessarily been a priority topic until recently, and that concerns me. But I, again, I'm happy that it's happening now. Um, and I know we couldn't anticipate anything that may or has come down from the state, um, but I feel like um, I wish that there had maybe been more groundwork. Again, this is me as an outside observer, but more groundwork laid such that we were ready to go when the time came. Um, and then I just want to sort of um, echo some of the things that Kristen said in that as we now move forward in these discussions, I just want us to take a very thoughtful approach 
to how we increase and advance in-person education for our students. Um, so we want to improve their overall experience, both academically and social emotionally. And so we don't just want more bodies in the building. We want sort of more bodies learning with their teachers, which is what they do best in sort of interacting, obviously with masks on, but interacting with their peers. Um, that is how we're gonna improve their overall wellness. So again, thank you for all that you're doing and um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have other people wanting to speak? Court, I'm not seeing, I don't know if you've seen hands, uh, raised, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm I can't looking, see them. Yeah, I'm looking right now. I don't see that we have anybody that wants to be recognized. Um, if you don't have the raise your hand function available to you, you can turn on your camera. And uh, I see Mr. Benjamin, Todd Benjamin, please. Yes, hello. Hi, thank you for, uh, let me lower my hand there. Thank you for uh, letting me speak. And certainly uh, it's great to hear the, the news that Dr. Hunter shared with us uh, about April 1st. Um, I wanted to um, let everybody know who didn't have the, the, the benefit of, of um, seeing the petition that uh, this morning I presented the school committee members and uh, Superintendent Hunter with a copy of the petition from Back to School Concord. And uh, the petition represented hundreds of Concord residents that signed the petition and demanding a return to full-time in-person schooling for March by March 15th, 2021. Uh, and, in, in, included in that petition were some comments, and I hope you had a chance to, to read some of those comments, because the comments from families and from students show how the current lack of schooling is really harming our kids. The reasons that have been provided as to why our children are not getting the education they need uh, just clearly are not acceptable. And, and I'm glad to hear that it seems like we're moving beyond just having more excuses presented and 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 having more planning done and and not having any action uh, the, as we know the administration the schools everyone involved has had months to return uh, have months to plan for a return to full-time learning so it's good to hear that we're on the same path um, because as we all know every day that our kids are not in school full-time is a failure of our commitment to our kids education and to our and to their well-being so I guess one thing that I'm still a little bit confused on is through my many discussions with people involved in school operations, the two issues that seem to be the holdup, at least for the elementary school students, are lunch and afternoon specials. And I guess I'm not understanding why we can't solve those two issues in two weeks and get these kids back for March 15th. Because again, every day is crucial to their learning and development. Uh, surely we can have kids eat lunch uh, at their desks. Surely we can have kids uh, do a Zoom specials in school, just like they do Zoom specials at home. And surely it doesn't take two weeks uh, and more than two weeks to implement that. So in closing, I'd like to, again, uh, urge that we prioritize our kids' education now and get them back in school by March 15th. Uh, when I've attended previous uh, school committee meetings, it's been frankly disheartening to see that there has been routine updates on the middle school building project, but yet it is rare to hear of any updates for planning to get our kids back in school. So hopefully we can get our uh, priorities realigned, continue to focus on getting our kids back in school and get them back at least at the elementary school level by March 15th. And uh, I'd appreciate understanding more fully why we can't do that or uh, why we have to wait until April uh, to get the, the elementary kids back. Uh, to school full time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Do we have other public other comments, please? New speakers, returning speakers. Anyone? I don't believe so, Sarah. Oh, John. John. Oh, John sorry. Matt. Yeah. Yeah. We have we have a few coming. Dr. Madden, would you care to turn on your camera? Hi, everybody. Um, so I'll keep it brief. Sir, it, if you just forgive me, just protocol, name and address. Oh, yeah. Uh, John Madden, 1394 Main Street. Thank you. And um, so I think um, what we're hearing uh, at, at, on this occasion is, is largely positive, and we're happy that it's moving in that direction. 
Um, I don't want to kind of repeat everything that I went into before, um, but I just wanted to say um, we do appreciate uh, everything that you're going to try and do to get the kids back into the classroom. Uh, we do want you to succeed at it, and we are behind you to make that happen. Um, bringing out the survey was a real good help. I think it's a great step in, in, the, in the right direction. Uh, it's never too too late to do the right thing. And um, I think, you know, from that petition, there's over 400 uh, parents that have signed up uh, in just about 24 hours. So although it may be difficult decisions and unpopular decisions, like I said before, among your peers, um, I think you're going to have a huge support from the public. It is the right thing to do. And we are fully behind you to do the right thing. Uh, you do have our support at the end of the day. Thank you very much, sir. Right. Thanks for everything. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kara Dyer, I saw your hand raised before. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, actually, it was my daughter. I. We haven't attended uh, one of these meetings before, and I have my middle schooler here, and she wanted to sort of say a few words about this, and and I um, just want to um, work where Cara, Cara Dyer and May Dyer um, were at nine forty nine Main Street. Thank you, and um, we also are, also are in support of bringing kids back to their teachers um, in person as much as possible. And May just wanted to say one thing, if that is appropriate. And very, okay. very much yeah. so. Thank you for joining us. Yes. Good evening, um, May. Hi. I, I just say that you're in middle school. Um, well, I'm in middle school, sixth grade. And I just wanted to say that it, on Zoom, it's kind of hard to ask questions and to um, pay attention because you're not really with your teachers, and it's kind of hard to see your friends. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we all understand that. Um, no. And any other? Any? Um, I'm, other seeing, I'm seeing none, Sarah. All right. I think then with that, we will end the public comment section of our meeting tonight and uh, move on to the reading of the minutes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you all for, for coming and speaking. Uh, to the, Sarah, I'd like to uh, make a motion that the school, the uh, school committees uh, approve the minutes of the joint meeting of February 2, 2021 and the executive session minutes of the meetings of November 10, 2020, November 17, 2020, 12-1, uh, 2020, and 12-15, 2020, please. Might there be a second to my motion? For both. I was muted. Second. Oh. Okay. Discussion? No. Many thanks. Detailed minutes. Uh, roll call. Anderson, I for both. Booth, I for both. About I for both. Maestad, I for both. Rocky, I for region. Rainey, I for both. And Wilson for region. Thank you. And now on to old business the 2021 2022 school calendar. Oh, great. Thank you. So uh, when we, this is the same as what you looked at last week with a little bit of addition. We did get the uh, half days at the high school on here and they will correlate into days where we can do some um, district wide across all the schools collaborative PD. So excited by that. So you'll see those four dates are now noted. Uh, there was one other addition just to note the first day of preschool as well. We wanted to be sure it was a preschool through 12 calendar, which actually leads into our older kids of post-secondary as well. So I think it's otherwise as you saw it um, and we're, I know the community's anxious for the dates. So we're hopeful for a vote tonight, unless you have other questions or concerns. Uh, 
I don't, and I would note that we didn't receive any uh, public correspondence uh, following last week's uh, sharing of the of the uh, earlier draft of this. Okay, so we can move to vote. Uh, we can go to action items in a moment. Um, I think if I'm correct, Sarah. Uh, that's correct. That's correct. So we will we will continue with uh, Dr. Hunter and Jared with the recommended budget. Yeah, so I'll just open it up and then I'm certainly going to turn it over to Jared. Um, we're really here to provide mostly updates tonight. It's been a busy week with the budgets and uh, we've uh, heard from both finance committees, either directly or through their meetings and the outcomes. So we wanted to give you that update, um, show you where we are in relative to the Concord guideline. Um, and then actually we're able to propose some ideas of what you might do next. So Jared, I'll turn that over to you. Yeah, I'll share my screen. Can you all see that? Yes. Great. Um, so we have some 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 actually good news. Uh, last Thursday, the uh, Concord Finance Committee uh, increased their their guideline amount. Uh, as you know, the assessments, um, especially the Concord side, is sort of driving driving the numbers this year due to the enrollment shift. Um, so the as of today, our current um, assessment to Concord is $979,216. Um, but, and they increased their guideline to 9,931,231. 9 Therefore, we have a delta of $47,985 uh, in Concord, but due to the formula, we're actually uh, have a, a delta of $62,061. Um, so we sort of have a way that we could potentially get there. Can so, you go back, Jared, sure. go back one slide. Is it the assessment or an assessment change we're looking at? Uh, so this is the uh, the total increased assessment. So it increase is the assessment over, change. So increase over fiscal 21. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we are still, as we told you, we would be doing sharpening our pencils, taking a look at every line, uh, getting feedback from uh, school committee members. To get to that number, we, uh, we're recommending uh, two things if the committee uh, so chooses. Um, right now in the budget, the graduation line actually um, is still budgeted for two. Um, that's something that we, I probably should have caught before I brought it to you last time. Uh, so we are recommending to level fund it from FY20 and reduce the graduation line $19,598. And then the difference would be 42,463. When we do our budget, especially with special ed, um, we take a look at every single kiddo that, that, is, that is an out-of-district tuition. And we also have ones that um, we put money aside for because we're just not sure. We feel at this time, that with all of the contingencies that we have, uh, that we hopefully continue to uh, prepay some tuitions and we can carry over um, a, a max circuit breaker revolving account amount, um, that we can reduce the non-public tuitions, the 42,000 to get to the guideline number. Now, if we did that, here's what the, uh, the guideline numbers would be. As you can see right here, um, the difference between FY22 and FY21, the comparison without debt, um, that is what Concord looks at. Carlisle does look at the decrease with the decreased debt service, but this 931,231 is now at their guideline. Um, and then for, for Carlisle, um, they would have a negative assessment with debt of just under 240000 And I'm happy to answer any, any questions. I, 
I just wanted to add, I think, um, and we haven't met with them again since, but just in hearing from the Concord Finance Committee, their um, change of guideline, really, we we're grateful for that. I think um, there was a real effort to, to work with us and um, make this a successful budget season. We heard the exact, we didn't get into exactly numbers and trying to close close it all out, but Carlisle was of the same sentiment last night. And I think, you know, we're really working collaboratively and together and that feels really good, especially given the, you know, crisis we're doing it in the middle of. So I'm just grateful. Now, this, this follows last week's uh, uh, some, what was it, uh, 25 slides with considerable detail on the regional budget uh, recommendation for fiscal 22. Um, and Sarah, I would hope that we'd entertain questions that go back to that as well. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think last week we even talked about that, uh, that if people have questions, think about them and, and that's what we're here for today. Can I just follow up on Jared? Your, oh, sorry, Jared, you were going somewhere. <laughs> sorry, Jared. On your comments, a second ago, a minute, I just, you cut out on my side for some reason, and I missed, as you were saying, the decrease on the special education. Um, we can do that because of the new, um, basically, your new projections of what we'll have after um prepaying and, and rollover and that kind of stuff. Sorry, I just missed what yeah. you so, so a couple of things. One, we, we have um, gotten the good habit of being able to prepay tuitions. Right. We, uh, at this time, I, I do think that we will have a max circuit breaker carryover for next year. And then when we do our budget, we always have some unknowns right. uh, and, and we put a little bit of money aside uh, for, for the unknowns. Uh, but with those three, um, uh, with the two contingencies of prepaying and the circuit breaker, I feel comfortable that we can reduce the 42000 And if that does uh, happen, uh, we can pull that money from other places. Okay, good. Thank you for missing. I mean, sorry for missing part of it, but that's great. And I would just echo, look, this is great news. Um, and I just really appreciate how, especially recently, the past few years, our relationship with the Finance Committee has gotten even better and better. And I feel like they're really listening to us and understanding our needs and where we're going and understanding how much work Jared has done to get the budget to such a transparent place. So just huge appreciation for that relationship. It's really nice. Okay. And I think tonight, Heather, uh, you would say this too. I'm sure it's evidence that we're listening to them as well. Absolutely. But, yeah. You know, you know. Thank you. Cynthia? So <clears throat> I just have some specific questions. One, uh, um, uh, we were given detail on the hardware, and I would ask, it's not, not necessarily pertinent to this FY22, but going forward, if we could get a detail on the replacement plan for our hardware in terms of the cycle and the longevity of our devices, when the next leases will probably be um, requested, that kind of thing. Yes, and I actually have that answer for you because we've been working on that today when you ask me. Um, so I, I can forward the answer. I'll give a highlight. I won't get into all of the detail. I actually don't need it tonight. I just okay. think it would be good to provide it in the budget book. Sure. So good just point. fill in record and, you know, we're all clear on that. Um, I do see some uh, escalations in software based on the spreadsheet you gave me. And maybe I'm reading it wrong. It, it has a section with current, I assume, and then additional, which I assume is adding to this year. And English went from, you know, this is approximate 5,000 to um, with an $18,000 addition. And the learning commons went from around 4,000 with a 25,000 addition. And that just seems like a lot <laughs> to carry going forward. So I'm just asking, maybe we can make some trade-offs you reduce yep. those a bit. It's just, it's not a one-time thing. It's a subscriptions. And then, you know, um, it doesn't leave you any headroom to add more going later. So I think we need to make some trade-offs. You know, I know I don't want to get into details. That's not my, <laughs> it's not my purview, but the, the, and the, the number we get at the end of the day is it's getting larger and larger. And I'm just wondering 
Yeah, yeah. No, Cynthia, we agree with you. Um, you know, I think we, we do have more discussion to have and talk with uh, staff on how it's being used, frequency of being used. Um, you know, what we, we have to work within a budget here, right? COVID allowed us a little bit more latitude on that to just say we need to get done what we need to get done. We've got to get back more towards a, a typical mindset, the tools we've grown to love in COVID that we hadn't used before. You're right. I don't think we can necessarily keep the entire suite. It's added up to an awful lot of cost. And um, the good news is the the all of it's now owned up at the district level. We can see that big picture. Sure. And I think that actually that was such a big project. I think we didn't allow you know we didn't have enough time to totally get into the next step, which is what you've just described. So um, I actually feel good that we're set up for that now. And yeah. that will not be something that takes us the whole budget. You know, we won't wait a budget season to do it. We'll do it as this year winds down and even talk about what we're bringing back in the fall. Um, so I think you'll continue to see those numbers, um, okay. you know, modify. It wouldn't be terrible, <laughs> terrible if we came in under the guideline in a reasonable way. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, I just am concerned that I don't, I see a little problem of equity across the various departments and maybe that's okay. Um, but I'm concerned that we're, you know, it, it just seems like I can understand if a certain department in order to deliver their program has to have yeah. the software or the textbooks or whatever. But, you know, I just want to be clear that these are absolutely required in a big way. Um, so that's that. Thank you. Yeah, I kind of share some of those concerns. I'm so the spreadsheet that I'm looking at um, came from Jared. And it's the software inventory and the purchase, and the, it it has three tabs with elementary CMS and CCHS. And I'm just unclear from this: is, the, is are these an inventory of the softwares that we intend to keep into the next budget cycle? Because I guess I know I asked this last week, so I hate to like ask it again. But it seems like the vast, not the vast majority, but approximately 50% and depending on the grade or the sort of, um, you know, grade level, it can be more was bought for COVID. So explain to me again, I guess, like why we're keeping them all. I, I think we're, I know we're you still, it. yeah, I think, you know, I, yeah, I think, I think the challenge in presenting this to you at this moment in time is we're literally mid process, but we have to provide you a number and a list. Okay. So we're going to be spending the rest of this year working through all of those review, fa you know, decision-making processes. Unfortunately, when we have to bring a budget to you midway, we have to err on the side of high because we don't have enough information and haven't had enough time to get it all the way to the, the absolutes. So that'll keep happening. Okay. Um, and we're also, you know, this list will get pared down. Is I expect idea? it will continue to get pared down. Absolutely. And I think, you know, this year we've got a lot of dialogue to have because our tools are in different buckets, right? We've got content based tools. We've got production and, um, you know, creativity kinds of output tools for kids. And now more than ever, we've got this high level of infrastructure tools, Zoom being a primary example. Yeah. So we've got to keep reviewing all of that. Um, and it's, you can see it's, the list is big and it's just piece by piece. We've got to keep doing that at each department and talking our way through. Um, the other thing that's a little bit of discussion is you know, teachers need time to know what's going to be sustained and what they're going to morph out of. And we are allowing a little bit of transition process too. So there's a lot more to come. We're happy to bring you updates as the spring goes on and help you see the evolution of that list. Um, yeah, I just, I guess my, my, the gist of it, like, we've just listened to all year parents in particular yeah. talk yeah. about the challenges that they've had with their kids learning. Yep on computers. And then I just don't want to make, I just want to make sure, and I get that this is a big philosophical discussion that we don't need to have here, but I just want to make sure that that's not the direction. No, no, don't miss it. Move in yeah, and represents right. that. So great question, actually. And one I'd be glad to make really clear. Don't misinterpret the big, the, the largesse of the list as our indication that we want kids on screens all day in school, post COVID, 
that is definitely not the case. So you're just seeing it really raw is frankly kind of the word I'd say, where we've just gathered it from the departments, got it all in one place, started to vet it. The inventory's made. Now we can keep having those conversations. I absolutely agree with you, Alexa. Okay. Um, I'll make sure. In good news, I guess one good news, there are some gems on there that we didn't have pre-COVID. So um, there's been some really great gains in terms of which tools we're using. And now we just have to really vet the, the suite and get the, the option set down to what do we really need and what's to our maximum benefit, not just this you know library that's so enormous and expensive that we shouldn't be sustaining. Okay. We, we have lived through a few of what we have sometimes in this district called technology infusions, such has been their magnitude. Um, so I'm hoping once we get caught up with what we think we have and how we think we're using it, we stay caught up. Um, mm -hmm. I, my sentiments uh, were similar to uh, perhaps Alexis and Cynthia's. I, I put it to uh, uh, Mr. Stanton a little bit differently. I said I, I was anticipating that uh, the, the influx of uh, hardware and software during the past year would have resulted in a flattening, a plateauing, or a even a reduction in need for next year. So I, uh, that's the way I'll put it to you, as I was, I was a little bit surprised. Um, uh, similarly, uh, it's difficult for me to understand the, uh, the plan by which we pass on uh, these uh, computers, which we have in, in such abundance. Um, uh, and then we threw off our schedule last spring um, and, uh, and put more computers in the hands of more kids. So I'll need extra help this year in understanding that, uh, that plan whereby computers move uh, through the district across their, what is it, five-year lifespan. So I, I look forward to those continuing uh, uh, exchanges on that. Sure, and I, I, I'd heard that before, and we started by getting the inventory. I, I, I think we should have Peter Kelly come to a meeting and mm -hmm. do the big picture for you all so you can see the plan and how it plays out. Yeah, um, and, and I think if we have the decentralized use with a combination of uh, centralized uh, uh, information gathering, uh, curriculum, uh, software, hardware at uh, that level, um, operational at uh, Jared's and Peter's level, we're going to, we and you, Laurie, are going to know a lot more than we know now, and that's going to serve us well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I hope you can see even the progress on, to that point, just by having it all in one place um, is, a, is, a, is, is the biggest yeah. step to that next conversation. Yeah, right, you are. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Hold on, buddy. Um, I, I would uh, share at this point that uh, I was able to uh, meet with uh, Mr. Stanton and uh, Mr. Rames, uh, where they uh, were able to clarify some points for me. And if members have not done that, I want you to know that uh, they're, they're very amenable uh, because each of us have our own level of understanding and our own uh, areas where we might be not uh, feeling fully fully comfortable or informed. So, Jared, I hope you don't mind if I put that out there, but I know you have said that as well. So uh, I, I just want, want you to know it was immensely helpful to me. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I think I'd just remind you your formal budget hearing is next week. Um, gotcha. So it's more thing on not done. <laughs> Feel free to send more questions for the next discussion. Good. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Lori. Um, Fatima. Policies. All right. Um, yeah, so bringing back one policy that we've had a chance to um, review and discuss further than we had done uh, first time around in January, uh, the uh, policy subcommittee met. Uh, we've had our um, monthly meeting this past Thursday, and uh, I think we devoted much of the meeting to this one policy. As I said, uh, 
last uh, meeting, I felt that I hadn't done my due diligence and I felt that the topic or the policy uh, needed further discussion. Um, so thank you for giving us the, um, the time to, to, to discuss it. We are coming to you um, with a recommendation that we came to uh, with a split vote. And I can give you a little bit, um, I can go over the policy uh, as it exists now in the book and uh, the proposed language and um, where the policy subcommittee stands. Um, so I'm not sure if this is okay with the process, if, uh, the chairs, uh, can I do this at, the, at this point? And then we discuss um, when it is uh, time to approve the, the motion. Yes, this is presentation uh, uh, explanation discussion. So we will invite you and your, uh, your colleagues on the subcommittee to uh, share what you wish. Thank you. All right. So, um, I, I would like to share my screen, but um, I can give it a try if I may, please, because I have the two policies uh, side by side. Um, if I, let's see. Um, okay. I have them ready too, if you want me to do it. Okay, do you have them side by side, Lori? I do. Okay, that'd be great. Hold on one sec. There you go. So this, well, I'll let you talk now. Just tell me what's okay. up first. Let me just get out of this. All right, um, so th is this a proposed? Is this That's a proposed? Uh, no. So this is the policy. Um, yes, so the this policy- This is your current, well, just to make sure we're all the same, but this is the current one. <laughs> all, right, all right, so this is what we have currently in the book. And then we have um, a proposed uh, change from uh, the superintendent. Uh, so as it, as it exists, this uh, deals with um, the uh, admission of foreign students. So the school committee may accept tuition free on a space available basis, enrollment of exchange students fluent in the English language participating in an officially recognized exchange program and residing in one of the member towns. Verification of local residents and pertinent records must be in the hands of the principal before presentation to the school committee um, and permission granted. And the change that has been proposed by the superintendent is in the last paragraph, uh, where the verification of local residents and pertinent records must be present, presented to the superintendent instead of the principals. And uh, the new language also is leaving out the, um, the school committee from the decision making. Uh, as I said, we discussed it um, thoroughly and uh, we voted two to one to adopt the new language. Um, and I can explain my position uh, as to why I oppose the new language. And um, I would like to keep the policy as it is in the box where the principals are processing the application and the school committee is granting the, the permission. Uh, as uh, I had said to my uh, subcommittee, I don't see uh, the necessity to change it. I think that um, it would erode the authority of the, the school committee, which is unnecessary. And uh, we have very highly, uh, capable and um, uh, yes, highly capable principals, assistant principals and secretaries at the, at the school level. And uh, I think that we can uh, leave the, the processing of the application at that level. Um, and uh, yes, so for me, the again, the, the existing language 
continues you know, the, the spirit of student of uh, citizen government. Uh, the school committee is elected elected officials who represent the the citizens, and um, we are part of the the governing body of our school district. And I would uh, hate to see uh, that authority or that role um, uh, eroded. Um, so that is where I stand on this uh, proposal. Thank you, uh, Sarah. If uh, you are, if you concur, I think we should turn it to uh, Alexa and Eva, uh, unless they want to direct it to Dr. Hunter first, so that we lay the groundwork before yep. any of us uh, have questions. I'm happy to sort of give my perspective. So. The debate was actually great. <laughs> um, it was uh, really important, I think, for us to walk through this because it highlighted just so many different things for me that you know weren't part of the process when we first um, looked at this policy. And ultimately, my um, my thinking on the matter came down to a point that Dorothy Presser, who is our um, school committee advisor from the state pointed out, which was this. If in fact the school committee ends up being the final voice in the matter, um, we are now presented with scenarios where for whatever reason, whether it's in the hands of the principal or the superintendent, a student is not accepted into the program, then we become the final authority and any time a sort of disgruntled family, for what, again, for whatever reason that we would never be privy to otherwise, um, is not taken into the program, it then becomes something that sort of we have to arbitrate. And I just didn't know, you know, if, if that was something that really was up to us. And I think you know, we kept discussing, for example, the difference between the school committee's role in accepting um, students um, that are children of teachers. And, and I, we discussed the differences here. And I think it's important, for example, for the school committee to continue to weigh in on those processes because when we accept a student, let's pretend in first grade, this is like potentially a, I can't do the math, um, like a 13 year commitment that we are making to a student and a family to educate them throughout the tenure of, um, you know, their elementary and secondary education. This kind of a program where, where the students are being accepted tuition free is really like what amounts to a quick in and out. Um, so there aren't, there aren't the same sort of fiduciary, like it's not that heavy from a fiduciary standpoint um, that I think, you know, it makes sense for us to weigh in. So it was really, at the end of the day, those two things, we really didn't discuss, for example, as much the change in the language between the principal's office and the superintendent's office, because part of that language change um, was to reflect current practice. So that was, to me, the lesser part of the debate in, in terms of crafting the policy than the, the removal of the school committee in, in the technical granting of permission. So again, that's just sort of where I netted out. Sorry, that was long-winded, apologize. No, that was very helpful. Just just a helpful. point of clarification. Uh, Dorothy is with the Mass Association yeah. of School Committees, and we are uh, paid members of that organization, and uh, as such, can uh, call upon expertise out of that uh, that independent organization. Correct. Um, if I'm correct, Alexis is, uh, is Eva on your subcommittee as well? Yes, she is. is. Is there anything else to add? And I think we certainly want to hear from Dr. Hunter. If in fact you were the original proponent of this, I'm sure you can help us too. So um, I just wanted to add um, uh, this um, before we hear from Dr. Hunter. Um, 
I think Alexa uh, touched on um, many points that I, um, I've i looked at uh, this policy in very similar, similar way. Um, the thing that I do want to add is uh, we are basically cleaning up the policy to match what is happening currently in uh, practice. So it is consistent with, um, so our policy reflects what, what's consistently is happening on the ground. Um, and we are not, uh, just wanted to add that we are not removing the school committee role um, in the whole process because the first, um, the first portion of the policy says that committee, school committee may accept tuition free on space available basis. So it, it doesn't remove us from that, from the overall ro role of um, deciding whether um, highly uh, popular exchange program uh, that benefits um, our students just as much as the students that uh, uh, come in and visit us, um, you know, uh, and reaches the diversity of um, of our student body for a short time, um, that this um, highly, uh, uh, highly, um, uh, the, this this program, uh, we have the final word in saying whether we have the funds, we have the um, uh, broadband to to keep it running. What it does, um, uh, what it does prevent is, again, as um, Alexa mentioned, um, putting us in the middle of superintendent making decision. And and uh, a family that might not be happy uh, with with an outcome, uh, whether uh, the student meets the particular uh, criteria, and the, and uh, superintendent may may speak to the criteria that might uh, that are important to review. Um, one of them uh, is uh, language um, uh, uh, language requirement, English language requirement. So. Um, okay, so you, you make the important point that the uh, the first line uh, maintains the decision making authority at the school committee level. Um, Laurie, can you speak to this one? Sure, and I'm just not going to repeat what's already been said. I think just a couple of points of clarity. Um, you absolutely have retained authority to accept exchange students, and that would always be on up to you through this policy. So there is that process. Um, for me, much of the intent here was to have it mirror our logistical process right now. All enrollments are coming through my office for all of the schools, and that's recent over the last year and a half. So we were just trying to align it with that. Um, we agree once we hand it off, it's over to the principal's office, but we're the entry point for residency and or records and um, and such. I think that's really all I have to add. It was really well articulated, both all the perspectives, and it was a great discussion. A lot of, a lot of great talk on policy, governance, process, lots of great discussions. So um, that was, that was, I'm not sure fun's the right word. No, it was like for me. It was a great discussion. Actually, it was important that we did that. It yeah. was great. I really do. So uh, I, I'm not sure we want to debate this endlessly, but 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 I will offer up this. Uh, I, I spent most of my summers for the last few decades in schools and uh, uh, often elementary schools, and it was common to see new new families come in during the month of July and August uh, to directly to the elementary school. Um, and there was a, a certain, uh, what, uh, uh, closeness uh, between the principal or the, the principal's office and that family that was new and wide-eyed and curious about their local neighborhood school. Um, can you just speak to pros and cons of continuing to pull away this, uh, this task from the building base, which, because so much of our stuff we've pushed toward building base. Um, yeah, this, actually, this, this I, one we're doing the opposite. No, I actually think we've um, found a really nice middle. Uh, so we do all the front to end and we do it electronically now um, all through Aspen and through the process of sending documents. And Aaron's really just going through and making sure all the required pieces are there. Um, what it does do is centralize communication in terms of IEPs and ELL and 
other certain needs families might have because it gets communicated to the, the to the departments around us at the central office. However, once it hits a certain point of um, completion, it then goes to the building level and they go into all of their normal processes. They just get a package to work with. So the family does immediately get reached out to, um, does get invited in pre-COVID and post-COVID, that'll happen again. Um, there's packets at each school that are unique to each building and um, they take it from there. So I, I think I think we're doing both. And I hope that actually brought some consistency. We had some policy tightening to do in terms of residency documents and some other things like that that um, is going very well centrally. And then the um, principals and their offices take it and make it really personal and connect with families and um, get to really engage with them. Okay. I just have a question. So when when you when when the committee says that this is this reflect current practice, um, the it's current practice in our district, not current practice, not MASC. Uh, I think standard. it was kind of both. Okay. You I mean Dorothy definitely had some opinions on this. Uh, the process the, that we, we discussed um, is the implementation, the way it's, it's going right now. Um, my concern is that we're, we're, um, we have an administration or process that was not following the policy that's in the book, and we're looking to change the policy to align with that practice, whereas I recommend that we uh, correct the practice to align with the existing policy. I think that's where we... Um, were in terms of uh, process. And uh, to go back again to the, the hierarchy of the processing of the application, I think that um, it begins at the principal's levels and then goes to the superintendent and then the school committee. I, I, I think that would be the, the proper uh, process and pros uh, hierarchy in terms of processing these applications. Well, so I, I will add just a little bit here that we've built a very um, thorough system that um, is entering all of our incoming kindergartners, ninth graders, and just note that you're on a policy just for exchange students. So I, I just feel like I need to note that, that this has been a two-year project and it's working really well. I hear everything you're saying and I Hope you hear me saying the buildings have a level of deep connection and commitment to the process once we finish with it at our office. Um, anyway, we could have a whole topic on that. I just wanted to be sure I was able to say that. Uh, I'll share that I'm finding this persuasive, uh, even though I'm inclined toward uh, uh, connections that are very tight between parents and those neighborhood schools. but. Uh, to that point, this really isn't a neighborhood school question. It's mostly a high school question, isn't it? Is it exclusively a high school question? Do we accept exchange uh, below grade nine? No, no, it's a high school question. Okay. Oh, we don't. I thought we did. <laughs> Maybe we need to to make that clear in the policy. And I do. I missed this last time, but I would really like to change the word fluent to working knowledge. I mm -hmm. think. Yeah, well, there, there is a normal. Um, Usually, is, they go when they do an exchange student, they exchange program and it, through an accepted program that the school accepts. Right, they, the the students have to do an interview um, that that certifies their level. Well, it's of, not a TOEFL or something like that. It's the yes, program yes. itself. They have a, they have a in, they have a conversation based oh, interview. Okay. We hosted we hosted a student for a friend of ours child, daughter who uh, from Italy who stayed with us for a year and was a student a couple of years ago. So we went through all of this. So. Right, but I I would like to change the wording from fluent if yeah. we can. The other thing is I would like to be sure if it's if it's only the high school we should specify that, or we can make it looser and say grades six or twelve or something. I do think you want to just note that in terms of the English requirement, there's a um, standardized approach to that through an assessment that kids take, and they need to typically there's a threshold score that right. schools are looking for, um, because otherwise you will have to provide ELL services. Yeah, so I thought we could include that in the language, a specific score, a passing score for the TOEFL. That could be specific. No. 
so the exchange program sets those standards. Is that correct? Um, usually some of them do, and sometimes they don't. So it's, it varies on the source of the program. I, I'd assume that we, I, I, I mean, looking at this, like we, the school committee's now been removed from the, or is proposing to be removed from the acceptance of particular students, but still no, no. we can, I thought that I read the new policy as we can approve the use of the, you know, the practice of, of exchange students that meet these following requirements, but that we don't approve individual students themselves. Those are certified right. through the superintendent's office. Right. Right. Well, then, I, then, then I've had two understandings in the last 10 minutes. Um, and maybe it's just me because I, I thought the case was being made that that first sentence uh, kept the decision-making uh, responsibility in the hands of the school committee. I think that the way we concluded our assessment of that first sentence at the conclusion of our policy meeting was that the school committee endorses and that's the existence of the program and that is our role. So we support having this program, but we are not, we are no longer in the business, if you will, of approving individual students. So I think Sarah nailed what we kind of concluded at the end of our policy meeting. And, and by virtue of that, I feel that we, we, we can decide, I guess, and although it's not explicit, like, if we think that a program follows a good protocol for determining uh, student eligibility, right? Like to, that, so we wouldn't, you know, if Lori says, here's, here's a program that gives a kid a, a spoken test and a written test, and here's another one that just says, there's a box that clicks, can you speak English? Yes, we would accept, you know, we could accept students from this one, but not that. I have a question. Laurie, are you right now evaluating students, uh, uh, all the prerequisites that the student has to uh, meet, meaning, meaning are you making sure that uh, the, uh, well, let's put this this way. Most uh, international students want to come, come to US to practice English, whatever level they have. Um, they are not coming here to le learn the content. They're coming here for the social, cultural, and, and, and the language, uh, uh, and the language um, exercise, right? So yeah. at this point, when you are reviewing the uh, the stu students, it, it seems pretty uh, pretty uniform that you're not going to be taking students that will require ELL um, uh, services. So um, any other student, uh, I, 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 from what I'm hearing from some of the school committee members, um, you know. <laughs> It almost seems like we are increasing the requirement, language requirements. How you know, um, uh, and expectations of, of, of the student um, to be at the level of our, our, our American uh, counterparts, right? Our own students, or or um, are we? You know, are you? Is there a protocol where uh, it, it seems like whatever you've been doing so far, right? The protocol was to make sure that the students do not come in and uh, use the ELL uh, services that cost us money. And I think that was that was Cynthia's point, is that right now it says you must be fluent and right, which would put them at the, the level of, of a not, you know, I don't know, well, anyway, it, the, to be fluent, and she says that saying something, a working, you, you know, usable working knowledge of the language. Is it's different. fluent too strict, basically. It, that the same fluent is too strict, right? Like I speak another language conversationally, right? I can read and I can have a conversation and if you put me in a classroom, I could follow along, but I would not call myself fluent, in, right? And I think that Cynthia's point is that putting that fluent in there is a, it's it's a bar that's really hard to, to one, to evaluate, right? What is fluent? Um, and so is the, what, Cynthia, how did you describe it? Was it working, working knowledge, work conversation? 
working, working, knowledge of the language. Yes, I'm not an expert in how <laughs> these things yeah. are uh, assessed, but you know. What about, Laura, can we ask a question? If let's say we changed it to something like proficient instead of fluent, does that, what does that change for you? Does that change your ability to manage this program, keep it realistic, anything like that? I don't think so. No, I think that's, that's fine. Okay, so I like, I mean, I like Cynthia's point. And Cynthia, what about a word like proficient instead of fluent? Is that, is that a bar that's more realistic to everybody? Yeah, that's, everybody knows that's a much softer term. Mm -hmm to me, because fluent sort of. <laughs> I think that's a good point. Yeah, to Sarah's point, having having lived in another country and struggled through a language, fluent is tough. <laughs> um, yeah, I like proficient. It means you can, you can get by in this scenario without us having to put ELL resources in. Right. Um, OK. Well, um, is, there any, so is, there any, is there any reason why uh, coming before the school committee after you have ascertained that a student is eligible uh, wouldn't be in the best interests of the school district? Well, you, I, I think my concern would be procedural and time timelines. Um, you'd be receiving lists of kids to approve. Um, and we'd have to sync up timelines to make sure enrollments weren't slowed down and access and things like that. I, well, you see, I, I my personal was, concern, you'd be yeah. managing a lot of detail and have well, to keep a certain pace. I, I, yeah. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beg to differ and say uh, this policy says you are going to manage the detail um, and, in fact, manage more of it than the principal ostensibly once did. Um, and the very fact that there might be uh, more than an occasional, that there might, in fact, be a list reinforces to me the idea that should uh, remain in the hands of a school committee for a, for a final acknowledgement or sign off. I, I Again, would I would Dorothy, like to bring up what? Sorry, Dorothy's concern with that court was that when you have a disgruntled family, you're you now become the arbiter. Right. And we, own it, we, we own the problem faster than we would if uh, the problem started with at Lori's level. Exactly. I understand that. So I I'd love to weigh in. I am certainly, I've never been one to blindly follow NASC recommendations on everything, but I do lean to the side of what Dorothy's saying here. Um, and I also think this is a, <laughs> to your point, Alex, it's an interesting discussion because I think this is somewhat of a, a bigger picture discussion here about school committee authority and where where we need to spend our time. I think we're talking about something that to me is much more administrative. And yes, there are two different questions here. There's the approval and there's the, does it go to principal versus superintendent? The question of principal versus superintendent to me is completely a matter for the superintendent. Um, I feel like that's her decision. And if we try to, to push on which is better, I feel like we're getting into, into her weeds, which I don't think we should do. In terms of the authority to approve, I also feel like this doesn't need to be our realm. Um, and I think to say we're taking away the authority of the school committee on something where I, I don't think we necessarily need it makes that a, a less relevant point. I don't think we need to be in the weeds on this. And I feel like, like Eva and Alexa said, the school committee is weighing in here by approving this overall program and process. And that we don't need to get in the weeds of which specific kids we're bringing in. I, I strongly feel that's not our job. I would, I would counter with, uh, I, I don't think uh, that's where we would pay attention to, you know, particular kids um, because the details on those kids would not be necessary if Lori's office or a principal's office, but uh, to your point, Heather, the, the superintendent's office, has said this uh, this application has passed muster. Then our job is not a particular child as compared to some other child. It's instead, here's somebody eligible, so we're going to devote district resources to support this child for a year. It's At that point, it's pretty simple. You could say it's pro forma even, and I would venture to say it probably is. 
at least, at least it's, it's, at least it's, it's known at that point that we're devoting school resources to another exchange student or to a list of exchange students. I think that should yeah. be on some radar that uh, goes beyond Lori's office. Just my, so think, my opinion. So by doing this, what I'm saying is by supporting the program, we are doing exactly that. It's just that instead of doing it each time somebody applies, we're doing it now. We're saying we agree to put the resources behind this. Yeah. I, I'm so not we're I, doing I, exactly I'm, that. I'm not going to support carte blanche for a unknown uh, an, an unknown responsibility, a, a responsibility we can't quantify for numbers. I'm not comfortable with that. I'm sorry. Yes, and I would add also uh, that the policy as it exists aligns also with other policies um, in the book in terms of admission um, going through the uh, school committee. Um, and again, we're not getting in the ways we're not talking about micromanagement. We're talking about the authority to admit students to our school district, which, um, again, will be uh, using our resources and, and uh, our, our budget, and that comes. And the liability also that that is that that is a liability, and we are taking responsibility for these students when we approve them. Um, and I think it, if if anything, it does. Uh, free the central office from this uh, responsibility. And um, that's where uh, the responsibility of the uh, school committee falls. And uh, I, don't, I don't think it is fair to ca characterize it as uh, getting in the weeds and uh, micromanagement. Salma, when you say that it's it's how we already do acceptance of, of students, I mean, I, I, I would think a case could be made that in some cases, we accept students if they meet certain, you know, for residency, for example, right? If you meet residency requirements, it's not that the school committee says, okay, here's a list of 1,300 students and right, they, you know, they need to be voted on. As long as it's more like that first paragraph of the revised one, right? The school committee accepts students who meet the residency requirements and that information is verified by the superintendent's office, correct? And uh, instead, when we get to something like like staff and faculty children, then it flips and goes back more towards the current language, correct? Yes. A and from, way of characterizing? Yes, and, and for me, I don't see the difference uh, if we approve, uh, yes, it is a longer term uh, uh, commitment with the children of staff, uh, but I think the the two are the same. And uh, if we are approving uh, children of staff, we should apply the same uh, principle to uh, admitting uh, foreign students. Um, and uh, the, the, that first sentence in the policy, um, I don't feel very comfortable with uh, the word may in a policy. It's not explicit, and I'm, I'm very uneasy with uh, an explicit explicit words in uh, when, when, when we're dealing with policy. I would like that to be uh, clear, not the word may. So it's not really dependable. It doesn't really define our role. The word may there, that first sentence for me, does not define the role of the school committee um, because you know it's may. Um, I think that just provides us flexibility so that in times of fiscal crisis, for example, we can say we as a school committee you know, now should suspend this program. I mean, I think, you know, we advocate or we approve for these programs and then there could be times, right, without saying, I don't approve Fatima and Jared and Cynthia explicitly, we might have to say, you know, this is not a time where we can allocate resources so we may pull it back i think i think in this instance i see like kind of what you're getting at but i think in this instance that flexibility is essential right so that we are not always locked into these kind of high level programs if in fact it doesn't make sense for the time whether that's for fiscal reasons or other reasons that i can't you know right now predict so what happens if if the superintendent authorizes a student, he, I don't know, over the summer, right? And then school committee convenes in September and starts looking at the year 
well, and let's, see, let's see, usually it's, these kids are approved usually around February or whatever. But let's say that, that, that the superintendent authorizes a student before the school committee has come to the realization that the year in which this, this student would be coming is a year where we don't have the resources, right? What happens if the student's been authorized, but the school committee then votes to revoke access to exchange students? What, how does that get reconciled? I, th I think that's where I'm really confused. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that the policy um, uh, makes that clear because the, um, the current one. Yes, yeah, no, yes, the current. I'm not talking about in the revised. In the revised, I'm not quite sure how how that plays mm, out. Okay, I see, I see. Okay. And the current, I understand. Like you know, she she nobody or the principal, I guess, as it is right now, is the principal. Nobody can approve the student officially until. Right, I see. Right. Mm -hmm. And again, having gone through this, I can say it takes it did take a while to get through the school committee approval process. Like I I hear that as this. I remember that that being long, but I just I don't know how we how we um resolve that tension about what if a kid gets preemptively approved and the school committee says we can't do it this year, right? I think the answer to that question actually is, is an argument as to why we need to um, keep the policy as it exists so that we don't get into um, a scenario like that. I don't know. That. Laurie, would you mind commenting on that and on how you see it working? Because I think you've thought through this, the logistics of it, more than most of us who are just seeing. Just so I think we have to parallel it really exactly the way we're doing with the staff kids. Like we get it all bundled up and feel like it was tight and then bring it to you. I don't allow access to the staff kids to the school until you've approved it. So there'd be, I think Sarah, to your point, there's no, you know, preemptive. I don't, they don't enter until you've approved. But in the new, in the new iteration, they would. In they the new iteration, they would be subject to our approval. Uh, yeah, right, right. That is right. So, does this mean that sort of at the, in September, the school committee has to vote that says, okay, like we will accept applications for exchange students for the following year? Or, I mean, is that how it gets resolved? We could do that. I don't think the way it's written, like you'd have to do that because this would probably stand as an umbrella policy, unless you changed changed it and you know pulled back but you could say it's going to be reviewed annually sort of like school choice where you do review that on an annual basis and say whether you're going to participate or not because i just feel that i feel like the school committee there's a chance that and again this is you know for a small number but there's a chance that the school committee does cede too much oversight over it by not having there's no way to stop it right like there's no way to if, if approvals have been made, contrary to what the school committee and prior to the school committee voicing their their op, their their concerns or opposition or, or desire to stop doing, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, that's my only. That's that's the only. I mean, thing I like, guess it would go the way the st the staff one does, where we bundle it into a package and say all we can do is get it to a certain point and then we have to bring it to you. And, you know, my last words to teachers are always the school committee has final approval. Right. Um, but I'm, I mean, or what Sarah just said, we have a, a yearly or what you both mentioned a yearly approval process. Every September we look and we say, okay, are we still accepting exchange students for next year? We take a quick, presumably quick mm -hmm. vote on it most years. Yes, we are. And then for that year, you're off and running. Here's my problem with that, Heather. Our acceptance of staff uh, staff children is largely obligatory. It's already in their contract. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> that would be a, an interesting and unfortunate case if we uh, said no. Um, this is different. This is not uh, obligatory. This is not required. So what I'm uh, seeking is not necessarily that it's principal or 
superintendent. I think uh, Dr. Hunter's made a good case for she's got it working there and has had it uh, so for two years. I'm hearing that we've got some uh, agreement around uh, the language uh, uh, proficiency. Um, uh, to me, what's left is, do we see this come across our desk the way we see individual uh, staff children come across our desk. Uh, I don't see any reason to change it. Um, I think given the hour and we've got people in the room waiting for other items, I think we should decide in the next few minutes, uh, is this going to be moved? Then we let the chips fall tonight or uh, do, do we not move it and uh, uh, have the subcommittee and uh, Dr. Henner go back with some sense of the sentiments of this committee? I think that's where we're at. What do you think, Sarah? I just offer one last thought. One thing that I'm remembering came up at the discussion was we could do a much better job and, uh, you know, whatever way you vote, it's totally fine. I think we still, you know, need to look at a better um, process of informing you of enrollments of, um, you know, so you have a better knowledge base of who's in the buildings and the exchange numbers and um, just, a, you know, a sharing out that we haven't been doing so and i think and i think that, that we would supports, do no matter what that supports the idea of having it uh, come across our desk um and in regard to timing be it august or february i don't think any school committee has ever squawked uh, about uh, the timing of one or three or six uh, staff children coming at us uh, at any particular point in the calendar year um, oh, I just have a question. Does this apply also to kids who are on those like week long exchange programs? I would think it would have to the, the Denmark trip and the. It's not just kids who are there for one semester or a whole year. Right. I, I would. For any, yeah. any yeah. foreign based. Okay. 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 That's what I was going to raise because we're kind of, uh, uh, we, are, we have an obligation to uh, uh, allow these students to come in and and spent some time at uh, CCHS if we have sent our student to, to Denmark. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. I, I'm gonna propose that yes, it's getting late and um, and and I think there's there's definitely, we know that there, there, there's a language issue to, to work out, but there's still some, I think there's some more formula to work on maybe. That's fair I enough. Just, I don't want to send this back to the policy yeah. committee to have the same debate they've already had. I mean, let's. I, well, I think it, it wouldn't be. They've heard us tonight, though, Heather. I, I, I would hope it's different. Otherwise, we wasted the last half hour, which I, I don't think we have. I, I think they have heard something tonight. I hope so. True, but I, but I think there are still there are two opinions on the issue. It, it's not like we're sending them back with a a clear answer. I guess my only question is. Do we just vote on it as is with the with the fluency to proficiency change and and see where we end up unless we're asking them to change what they're bringing us somehow? Well, you heard my sentiment. I'll say it only one more time tonight. I want the school committee to uh, formally uh, accept uh, uh, d students who uh, don't reside in our district or our, uh, our participants in our METCO program, uh, be they staff children who live out of the district or, or anything else. I, I, I think that's a school committee a prerogative and a necessary one on behalf of the, the, the communities that we serve. That's just an opinion of one. Not my, my opinion is that I, uh, go ahead, Alexa. So it's not just may, uh, school committee may approve the uh, uh, the students coming from the exchange program, you uh, you you would like to add uh, a, a set time uh, that we approve each. each no, student. no, it's it's set time. I just want the I just want the superintendent to uh, to bring it to us the way she brings exchange students. Uh, excuse, me, brings uh, staff children to us. Very simple. Always works. Always works. And for consistency as well, it's consistent with the, the way we do it across the board. And I think I'm looking for something in the middle that that we still keep some kind of a, some sort of say over whether or not to it's annual it's, approval, right? To have to have exchange practices, um, but I don't know if I want to be. I don't. 
I'm hoping we get to a point where we're not meeting weekly. Um, and, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> um, and that, I, and that I, I think that there are, you know, I don't, I don't think I want that kind of oversight. So that's just, I want to, I want to find a middle ground. I don't I feel that the language as it's written right now gives up too much control from the school committee. I don't see how we actually authorize through that, like or execute um, the ability to say no to to exchange students, right? We may approve, we, we may accept them, but it doesn't say how do we go about not. So then maybe it is worth bringing back to the committee to find that m median language there. That I would, that I could see. I didn't want to send it back to you to just yeah. say, just to rehash the right. same thing again. Fact, right. is, if we're asking you to come up with medium language, so to speak. Right. I and the genuine compromise. I think. And, and yep. what I hear is that people are primarily, like, mostly okay with the moving of the, to the superintendent's plate off of yeah. the principal's plate. Yes, definitely. I think everyone supports changing the language of fluent to proficient that yeah. Cynthia caught. I think that was a good one, too. It's just whether we want no oversight, an annual approval of the spirit of the program, or individualized list of students as they come intermittently throughout the year. Is that a good summary? Yeah, and if you could bring us language for that, that middle. middle option, that would be great. And if you bring us language for the option I'm promoting, I'd love to see that also. Yes. And it would be helpful also to have um, the different dates that we accept. Are they, are they set dates or can can it be any time across the year? I think we leave that alone because uh, we have exchange programs and we are entrusting the superintendent to bring it to us. She's not going to bring it to us unless she thinks it's in keeping with what this community wants as represented by its school committee. Uh, I, I, we, we've got to give her those reins. I, I think you can come up. I don't know. I feel like there's going to be something like as the as the teachers are planning their exchange programs for the next year, and as those conversations, that would be an opportunity for Dr. Hunter to say for the following year, right? Um, this is what we're thinking because it it it, it impacts it, it impacts a lot with, if it, if it's also this week long. Program. The vote on our agenda, do we have to vote to a straw not to have a vote? No, if, if nobody moves it, nobody moves it. And, okay, uh, thank you. Yes, obviously. Yeah. Okay, so we're we're good where we are right now and ready to move on to the one remaining action item then, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Is there a motion to vote to approve the 2021-2022 school calendar? So moved for both committees. Is there a motion though? Oh, sorry, who said that? I said, is there a formal motion or we just? Uh, that was it as presented tonight, I think is uh, the, the, what Heather means, of course. Um, I would be happy to second that for both. Okay, discussion. Thank you, committee, for putting it together. And uh, that is not, not only school committee and uh, Lori, but uh, also uh, school reps. Thanks for yes. taking the time. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And this is a 21-22 calendar, just to be clear. Thank you. <laughs> Good point. Uh, roll call, please. Anderson, aye for both. Booth, aye for both. Uh, aye for both. Ms. Dad, aye for both. Sophie, I for region. Rainy, I for both. And Wilson, I for region. Thank you. Um, and with that, I will move, accept a motion to move to adjourn the Concord Carlisle Region School Committee meeting. Lucky so down. Moved. Second. Roll Anderson, call. Anderson, I. Booth, I. Out, I. Ms. Dad, I. Sophie, I. Rainy, I. And well, so I. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye. Thank Good you very night. much. So the Concord School Committee uh, remains in session. Um, I, I appreciated that last uh, discussion. Um, right. Uh, I, 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 Real nerdy. It but touches on a lot of things. Um, uh, so thank you. Um, I, I learned. I learned a lot. 
Um, we've uh, been fortunate to have some people uh, uh, with us tonight uh, for the next item, and that is the uh, Concord Middle School building project update. And uh, we'll try to be efficient. I think it'd be useful for Heather and Lori and I to each take uh, just a couple of minutes and uh, give you uh, what we believe is uh, a status report. Um, Heather, do you want to start in uh, on the communication side and other pieces? Yep, absolutely. Um, and I will, um, sorry, I'm just pulling up what I'm going to look at here. Um, I will first just kind of tee up our whole conversation. Court and Lori and I really wanted to update all of you um, and, and also kind of frame it. Um, you know, we're obviously, we're having listening sessions with lots of groups. And to some extent, this is our our listening session in a way with the school committee. Obviously we get into a lot more detail here sometimes. Um, and, and somewhat offer a reminder to myself as much as everybody else that we here at the school committee, basically Court and I want to hear all of your feedback so that we can bring it back to the building committee. We are your representatives to the building committee. And so when we speak at the building committee, we wanna make sure that we are accurate, accurately re representing you, all of us as a group. Um, we obviously can't make any decisions here because decisions aren't up to the school committee. So we'd really just love to kind of collect your opinions so that we can bring them back and, and represent them well. Um, so we thank figured you, we, what? Thank you so much for that. And I know you're gonna continue, but I wonder just as a courtesy, uh, we've been living on Zoom. We used to invite people to the table. Uh, and I wonder with your permission, uh, if we could invite uh, our representatives from uh, Hill and uh, and from SMMA to turn on their cameras and uh, uh, quote unquote, come to the table uh, <laughs> with us if they care to. Very good point. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. So- Forgive me for the interruption. Thank you. No, no, that's perfect. Okay. I'm, glad you, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned it. Welcome Peter and Phil and Kristen. We're so thankful to have you here. Um, Cause as Court and Lori and I discussed, we could sit here and give some updates and then everybody would ask us questions and we wouldn't be able to answer them all. So we're really <laughs> glad that you're here to help us answer all the questions. Um, so let's see, with that, if I forgot anything else important, um, <laughs> we thought we'd hit on four quick topics here. One, communications. Two, just kind of the concept of community use that's come up and been weaving through discussions recently. Three, design, the, the real core one, and four, sustainability. Um, so I'll start off with communications and I'll just do a quick update of everything that's been going on and everything that we're working on. Um, the, we're in a very active period right now. Uh, the, the big piece of communications right now is a lot of our public events and discussions. Uh, public events are happening in two different ways. One are the public forums. Of course, we had one last week. It was the second of a series of four that are happening over these few months very well attended, what, over 83 participants, I think 83 or maybe a little more than that. Um, great interaction and questions and engagement, everything really well presented um, by the chairs and Kristen and Hill and everybody who, who added to it. Um, this one was to go over space summary concepts, as you've all seen. Uh, the next two will be in early April to go over design concepts and then in mid-May to do basically an overview of, of the wrap-up of the feasibility study of this current stage. Um, so those continue. The other part of the events are what we're calling listening sessions, which are smaller group discussions and we've been doing a lot of them. I, I think our list is 15 or 16 already, uh, many of which have happened and some of which are still in on the calendar for the coming weeks and within the next probably month and a half. Um, we've done listening sessions, that, but I won't go through the whole list, but obvious, you know, the obvious ones like Select Board and FinCom and, and all of you, actually, we'll count you, that'll be, we'll count School Committee, it'll be another listening session on our list. Um, uh, but as well as many different groups in town from the Commission on Disabilities to the Council on Aging, the League of Women Voters, uh, the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail group, um, and several others. In order to do outreach, I actually reached out to every single committee chair in Concord. Um, and there are a lot of committees in Concord, <laughs> as we all know. We've heard back from a lot of them. 
Um, and the outreach was, we are willing to come to you. So we didn't want to make this something where people would have to come to our forums in order to participate. We offered to go to anybody's committee meeting, um, group meeting, whatever it was, and bring a couple of representatives, give our update, answer questions, and take feedback. Um, and so we're doing that all over and we're getting great feedback. We're having really good discussions. Um, a couple of them were very key to the design discussions that have gone on around the gym size, around the auditorium. And, and there were discussions specifically with, you know, Concord Recreation folks and sports, local youth sports leaders on the sports side. And then with music folks um, and town folks on the auditorium side. So we've really been pulling in all the various interested parties so that we can get their opinions in this process. Um, that's the, that, let me see, that's the event piece of it. Um, we're also looking at collecting input in other ways. We're talking about, so right now there's, there's several things in the works that you won't have seen yet, but we're working on. Uh, we're working on a public survey to get some more long-term input um, though that will be primarily questions that will be focused on things we'll be looking at during the schematic design phase. Um, in fact, I'm talking about feasibility and schematic design. And in case that's the timing isn't clear to everybody, maybe I should have backed up and said just for review purposes, in case it isn't clear, we are still in the feasibility study phase and we plan to wrap that up by uh, mid to late, by late May. So then we move into the more detailed pieces of schematic design. So the survey will um, likely address things that will be part of schematic design. Uh, we're doing a lot of work on the website right now. Well, I won't say the work yet, the planning for some work on the website right now and looking at a different, we're looking at a different way to host it so that we might be able to get some information up uh, in a more clear manner and just lay it out the way we want to if we use um, likely a Google site, for instance, instead of just the district um, site structure, just because it gives us a little more, bit more flexibility. So for now, we're getting all of our information up on the site as efficiently as we can, but we're looking at a different structure for that. Um, we're also looking at, um, and also just ways of uh, reporting back out the input that we get. So for instance, after the forums, Kristen has done a great job of providing the lists of questions and answers and everything. And we send that out. We have recordings of the forums. Um, and after the survey, we're looking at, you know, a way to do kind of a, a more organized representation of the feedback that we get from there. Um, given that it will be in a survey and all kind of in a common format there, I think we'll be able to do something where we report out on themes from the survey. Uh, let me see, I think that's the high level of the communication stuff that we're doing. Um, then from there, I think um, that dovetails right into, actually any questions on those specifically before I keep going? Okay, um, but that dovetails into some of the big questions. Obviously the, a lot of the communication is not just out Bound, which we're trying to do a lot of and get the word out as much as we can. But a lot of it is the inbound and really taking that feedback from the community. Um, and one of the big themes on that, in, in that feedback that we're trying to get is just community use um, versus, you know, educational use. Obviously, in building this building, our primary goal and the thing that we are most focused on is educational use. That's, that's um, set and agreed upon by everybody. But there are certainly many ways in which the building could be used other than that. The gym and the auditorium are really good examples of um, ways that there are desires for, for more use of the building. Um, and that becomes a really big question and court will get into more of the details of those specific discussions, but it is kind of a big picture question that we've debated back and forth around community use and budget, really. You know, we've We've set, the building committee has set a range of 80 to 100 million as our target budget. Um, we have not pinpointed any specific number yet, but we are, we would like to stay within that range and trying to come up with a plan that will stay within our, that range. Of course, there are lots of potential community uses out there that would be wonderful, but in order to incorporate them all, it would bump a number up above that 100 million. 
Um, and so that's, you know, that's a big high level theme is how much does the community really want? But, you know, does the community want everything? So it becomes a $120 million budget? Probably not. And we don't think we've gotten that feedback. So we're not heading in that direction. Um, but that's, that's kind of a constant balance that we're trying to play. And so far, um, we are maintaining with a goal of staying within that 80 to 100. And that's what all of the the work has been focused on, especially in terms of, for instance, the space summary that, that outlines all the different pieces. Those numbers were brought down a little bit so that we can try to keep that number realistically within that range. So again, that's kind of a high level concept of, of balance that we're trying to address. Um, and it does to some extent lead into court's discussion of design in more detail. But again, comments or questions so far before we keep going? I know I'm going fast just because of timing, but feel free to jump in. Okay. Then um, Court, do you want to take over from there and kind of move on to design, design and what's been yeah, going on in, certainly. in your world? Um, just quick question, Lori, do you sit on the sustainability group? I believe I do. I, I, I lose track of what I listen to and what I'm actually on. So I'm, not, I'm hesitating now that you ask me that. I'm always there, Court. <laughs> I right. believe well, I do. <laughs> and, we've, and we've got uh, Kristen and Peter in the room. And, and yeah, others. I definitely have the notes with me and I sure. can talk okay. on what, what happened last week. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to tonight represent the design subcommittee, uh, part of the uh, school building committee. And uh, we did... Uh, bring our recommendation phase uh, for this stage to a close last week. And we're gonna bring forward to the full building committee uh, on Thursday morning, 7.30, uh, the, the following, uh, that we are gonna send forward the, uh, what we call uh, portions of the space summary, effectively uh, the design at the level of detail we have it now uh, such that, uh, one, we uh, surround everything uh, in our decisions with the endorsement of, one, the team concept and the sizing and spacing required for a full team concept, uh, two, uh, a team concept that uh, has no teachers uh, crossing lines into another team, none of the core teachers. Um, and this comes at uh, some some cost in, in space and finance um, to have these uh, very intact teams and very intact spaces. Um, and there was a lot of debate about uh, whether that was uh, uh, the right way to go, whether it was necessary. Some people thought that uh, budget was a, a consideration there. Others said not so important. Uh, focus on the ed plan, leave the money for later. Um, the specifics, uh, uh, the group recommended that the uh, current sizing of 7,000 net square feet uh, go forward uh, with the full recognition that uh, this is not uh, satisfactory for uh, many people in town who want uh, robust community use uh, after hours. Um, so that's a conversation that continues at the school building committee level. Uh, similarly, uh, with our vote to support the current 270 seat, or shall I say one grade class, uh, one grade auditorium, uh, there uh, are sentiments in town that say uh, this should be a performing space for larger numbers for both school and non-school. Uh, I would note that in the very beginning, the discussion was, will this be the auditorium that uh, accommodates town meeting? And that got dropped out uh, rather rather quickly in, in the process. Uh, third, uh, in looking for uh, some kind of uh, efficiencies, we debated pretty rigorously uh, whether there should be an alt PE room or a multi-purpose room, a, a room that wouldn't be uh, necessarily scheduled, uh, but would be available for all kinds of uh, critical uses uh, and to include, but not limited to OT and PT and uh, uh, additional uh, gymnasium space. That was moved forward. Um, also a 1600 net square foot room 
Um, why was it debated? Because uh, it was one that uh, uh, didn't come across as uh, as integral to the education plan as some of the other items in the estimation of the subcommittee members, some of the subcommittee members. Next one was uh, uh, the media center to uh, uh, be a 3,400 net square foot media center. And that was uh, the only one that went forward without a, a unanimous vote. Uh, uh, but that one went forward uh, with uh, most of the subcommittee uh, endorsing it. And the next one was a maker space. Um, this one was again debated because the way in which it was going to be used uh, was unclear to some and uh, it was a, a non-scheduled uh, space uh, which uh, uh, suggested to some that it should be debated and considered does it stand alone does it uh, be part of the media center or I think it's right now probably going to be adjacent to the media center I'm sure Kristen knows where that might be uh, tentatively located now. Uh, and after those specific recommendations, we voted to simply send everything else in the space summary forward to the uh, full building committee. Uh, and I would note that that didn't include any deliberation of the non student facing spaces in the building, which is not a, not a small portion of the building is devoted to uh, all the necessary adult activities that support uh, that support students. Um, and I think that's as quick as I can make it. That's the essence of it, I think. Laurie, you were there. What do you think? That, yeah, that was that was you covered everything in a really nice, succinct way. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> Um, yeah, and, 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 and I would note uh, the, the work that follows is going to be even more difficult than ours, and ours was not easy. <laughs> it was not easy. Can I just yeah. clarify well, myself and Leslie like, brother? You said without deliberation of the non-student facing areas. That's probably without further deliberation, right? I mean, those have been certainly deliberated uh, and looked at in detail already. No, I, I beg oh. to differ. I'd say oh, uh, uh, oh. we various various uh, ideas get floated. Um, we now have two buildings with 151,000 square feet. A lot of it duplicated, a little bit of an unused. Um, the new building as designed today is 143,000 square feet um, with what I think everybody on the, uh, the subcommittee realizes is a lot of flexibility. Um, a lot of flexibility, um, and that, that's what that's what the debate centered around was: Do we need that degree of flexibility? Can we afford that degree of flexibility? Is that the right thing to send forward? And indeed, at the at the end of the day, we did send it forward. But no, we didn't debate uh, how big or small a school psychologist's office was, or uh, we didn't even get into the teacher workroom uh, to any 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 degree. Um, and uh, you know there were another another thirty rooms or so that we left alone because uh, certain adults need four walls and a door, um, and so we didn't we didn't get into that. But what it yielded what it yielded was ultimately uh, at the end of the day the current one hundred and forty three thousand square feet, which is not set in stone, but uh, it's the the number we move forward. What we didn't debate is what. Uh, we might call massing, which is how do you how do you put that together on the property? And so I think that brings up one other point, uh, which uh, Lori and, and I really want to make clear is one of our challenges uh, with uh, debates uh, like our wants for a larger gym or auditorium is that we're at uh, the limit of the impermeable uh, uh, covering of the surface right now. We're next to a groundwater conservancy district. We're limited to 15% uh, footprint, and we're there. And uh, we would be uh, foolish to bet on a variance on that. So instead, we've got to be creative on the design side. So that's where uh, uh, Kristen's team is going to have to come in. 
Um, sustainability, the little bit, and uh, Lori can use this as a segue. Um, right now, what we hear from the sustainability subcommittee is they're fully uh, uh, on board with Article 51, the sustainability goals for the uh, town of Concord. Uh, but in this building, it's going to translate as this will be an all electric net zero ready school, not a net zero school, but a net zero ready school, which, uh, and I know very little about this, uh, you know, Peter and Kristen can help us here, but uh, we think what that means in addition to all electric is it's going to be photo photovoltaic ready on the roof. It'll structurally be able to accommodate at some future date and uh, a parking lot could have a solar cover. Uh, if I'm correct, but I think Lori and uh, others can speak more to the sustainability piece of this with a current estimate of 1% of the total project cost, which right now is, is approaching 100 million. But again, those are rough numbers, early stage. I think I just had a little detail that the subcommittee um, voted last week to go forward. We're in compliance with it's been interesting, Energy Zero Code um, came out during the process, so we are complying with that, and um, we learned a lot, I learned a lot, the experts can chime in at any point. The regulations and standards in Massachusetts really heightened um, a year ago, so it was really helpful to see, not even a year ago, so it was been helpful to work towards that. Um, solar Ready, as, as Court said, um, 800 parts per million, which thanks to COVID, I actually know what that means. Um, outdoor air system ventilation and HVAC. <laughs> We're doing really good, compared, really well compared to that in our settings because I know what our measurements are. Um, indoor environmental quality, providing transparency and red list free daylight uh, percentages, spatial daylight of greater than 75%, um, annual sunlight exposure of less than 3%. Embodied carbon, you know, a goal of reducing the uh, embodied carbon in the building materials by more than 20% compared to an equivalent baseline. And I don't know if we've decided if we're going for the lead silver, but that's the, we're going to meet the criteria and then decide if we're actually getting the certificate, I think is where we left it. Um, so that's, that's a, it sounds like a list that uh, very much like the design group was a lot of discussion for a long time with the sustainability uh, subcommittee, a lot of really knowledgeable people there, a lot of lot of lot of knowledge base. So that I I just did the layperson's version. So I don't know if Phil or Kristen or uh, Peter want to add to that, but we landed in a great spot. I feel like everyone was heard. I feel like we found goals that people were content with, even though there had been some goals that were higher and a lot of discussion of EUI numbers and what the targets are and things like that. But um, we landed in a really good spot going into the recommendation Thursday. Good. Thank you. I'm going to ask for questions in a moment, but first uh, I'd like to have uh, uh, Peter Martini from Hill International introduce himself and tell us what an owner's project manager does. And then we'll uh, ask Kristen to introduce herself and her uh, team member, Phil Pinelli, who's with us. Peter, if you would, please. Thank you, Court. Thank everybody for having us having me on tonight. Um, we're, we represent Concord um, and we are uh, organizing the project. We track schedules, we track costs, we review the uh, we do organization meeting minutes um, and are the owner's representative um, from the beginning of the job to the end. Um, uh, Ian Parks is our project manager, unfortunately couldn't, couldn't be here tonight. Uh, I would just like to editorialize and, and say that the best projects we, wor we work on and the ones with the best results are the ones that have a lot going on at the beginning uh, and a lot, I think Court used the word debate uh, and analysis and questioning and input and those are all the best, uh, all the best projects. And that's what's happening here. And also just, just to report, since we uh, settled on a schedule a couple months ago, we're, we're on schedule, so. Good, so, so you're here to uh, keep us out of trouble, is that correct? Well, I, you know, <laughs> well, I, I guess that goes both ways, Corey. Okay, all right. Kristen, <laughs> if you'd be so kind. Hi, uh, Kristen Olson, SMMA project manager, architect, and also an educational planner. Um, and I'm joined by Phil Poinelli, our educational planner, also architect, um, and, and just 
immense amount of knowledge in educational programming. So he's always at the forefront of any design project on our team. But we're backed by a team of 30 plus um, design team members and, and consultants that uh, work to deliver all of the design information throughout the process. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. So I think we should open it up. Um, uh, why are we having this session? Uh, we go to so many other sessions because as a school committee, as soon as three of us get in the room, we're a quorum and uh, it's uh, uh, not uh, appropriate for us to have a discussion without uh, a formal meeting called. So this is our formal meeting with our design team and our OPM. Um, and so we, we wanna open it up right now. Questions, comments, concerns, goals? Hopes, aspirations. Well, I'll start off. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to really focus on the, the details of the uh, design summary or the education plan, which everybody's been working very hard on. My overall concern is that we are so very close to that hundred million dollar mark. And um, Kristen, my, I'm going to focus on the slide you presented. Um, I'm sure you know it by heart on the costs. Um, the initial building construction cost is based on 348 per square foot. Where did that number come from? So uh, SMMA has a number of in-house design projects that we looked at, and we also looked at MSBA project cost data that is published on the Mass School Buildings um, dot gov uh, website. And so we we looked at a number of middle schools and also some of our in-house schools and, and uh, just look to a certain, uh, to find a range. And I guess it's important to note that uh, if you've been listening in on some of our past sessions, no two schools are alike, really. And so um, to really find something that's apples to apples is very difficult. So we just looked for a range and, and um, worked with the project team to find where we'd be comfortable. Great. And um, uh Looking at the um, uh, notes below, it says that uh, based on removal of the low lower field work, which in my mind is the backfield, is that, am I correct? The one closest to the rail trail? Correct. Okay. And then it says other reduction in site development. What does that mean? So what we um, looked at was the initial treehouse, uh, treetop teams, concept and that had a site layout that also included some site bridges it had some preliminary parking assumptions based on where we were at with square footage at the time and number of classrooms and so all of those site development tweaks have been refined once again and so when removing the that rail trail side field scope and then adapting to replacing only the upper fields or the sandborn area um, fields in kind with the parking and the um, and the site bridges uh, is scope adjustment. That's how we reduce that cost. Okay, so the fields would, are still in scope. Correct. Yep. The, replacing the fields. Because mm -hmm. those are classrooms in my mind. Yep, yep they are. It's yep. a community resource. Um, again, once I assume, relatively soon, we will get to another estimator kind of exercise. So um, we are planning on marching on into a schematic design uh, at this time. We, we've discussed uh, whether it would add value to do another estimate, but all of our um, parametric or rough order of magnitude estimating that we've been doing to date is based on uh, similar information that the estimators would use. Um, so, so because we had the March 2020 detail and uh, we're able to extrapolate some very site-specific components from that and then add in our, our true K-12 project experience along with the MSBA data, we feel we have sufficient information to get us into schematic design. Because those estimates were much higher than March. Yes, one. yes. So that's my concern is what's the process if we get into schematic design and we find that our 555 was way under? Well, I can chime in a little bit, Cynthia. As we move forward here, we're constantly estimating. So as a as a year has gone by, um, we've taken into account, you know, where where the bidding market is. So that's like a year now. We we know what's happened since last year. Um, so we're, we're continually looking at numbers. 
Um, we are on several other projects where bids bids have come in re recently, mm -hmm. and they seem to be backing up the numbers uh, we had then. Um, also, since that time, the, the building has been further d designed with the auditorium and the gym and some, some square footage taken out of it. So as we've been going on, we, we've always kept all of this in mind. So estimating has continued to go. And I think the next big step is going to be, um, you know, during the schematic design, we come up with a number. And you're, you're right. I mean, what, you know, your, your question is great in the construction and design industry. What do we do? You know, I think we've made our, uh, if, if something isn't, isn't coming in the way we think it is, but we've, we've put a lot of thought and a lot of analysis have gone on with the numbers we are now. And we can only hope with the people who've been doing it, that we're going to, that we're going to find that the numbers are reasonably accurate. Um, but that's why you do it. That's why you do several steps along the way. But I just guess, you know, I don't need to know tonight. But, you know, if, if it is radically different, we're not just talking, you know, we can VE our way out of it. Um, because if you get into really deep VE, that's just not good for the project, in my opinion. And I think everybody would agree. Um, you know, I would just like to know what the, the tipping point is and how we might then look at further square foot footage reductions. Um, because uh, square footage reductions are our last resort. We typically can find um, some cost savings by re-reviewing re materials and making adjustments to something that's also durable and also, uh, you know, meeting the requirements, but maybe reducing tile height and things. So, so a lot of times we can get there on on value management, but um, it, but we do have project experience where you might uh, look to square footage to make some, find some more efficiencies. I mean. One example is we, we cut out tile at the high school and Dr. Hunter could tell you how many walls have been have to be repaired because we don't have tile at the high school. I mean, it's, as you know, it's really um, much more durable and um, it's easier to maintain for sure. The only one I wish you'd done something different is the boys' locker room. Otherwise we're managing it. <laughs> but um, I hear your point for sure. Just just one other thing. I, Dr. Hunter called out the Kennedy School in Natick and I just mm -hmm. Remind us that yes, it does have a lot of bells and whistles, but it also got thirty-six million dollars in MSBA re reimbursement, which makes that yep. um, more attractive uh, when you're trying to sell that to the community to add some non-reimbursable uh, elements to the project. So I think we have to be very mindful that you know that ended up being a seventy million dollar cost to Natick. Um, correct. Whereas we're we're at a hundred <laughs> for the town of Concord. So. Yeah, um, correct. I, I, I just, I think we have to be um, ready to pull back if we need to and not, um, you know, escalate this any anywhere above 100 million. It's already, <laughs> it's, it's quite a burden to the town taxpayer. So mm -hmm. that's all. Thank you, Cynthia. Thanks. Other questions or comments? If we uh, move toward the ed plan side of it, I think we'll hear again from Lori and certainly from Phil. Questions, comments? I just have a quick question. Um, when we move to schematics, what what's the timeline? Like how how long generally does that take? So when when will we have some of this resolution? You know, all these different unknowns with respect to cost and whatnot. Um, broadly speaking, schematic design is a six-month process, but that includes uh, c cost estimating, the value management, and all of the decision making. Yeah, Alexa, roughly, you're looking at 2021, roughly getting through schematic, and then 2022 doing the full design. Great. Um, so. Uh, I, I, I would like to use this public opportunity to say I, I, I share your concern, Cynthia, and I would tell our fellow school committee members, uh, we, we know that we had these pressures at the high school and uh, we made an early commitment to demonstrate that we learned lessons at that with that high school project. Um, one of the people who carried a good bit of that information, uh, Tim Holt, who was uh, indispensable to getting this thing started uh, is not on the committee right now. Um, but uh, um, you know, I think with our OPM uh, on board and this being a town project and town personnel uh, weighing in uh, along with our, our uh, design team that uh, 
we should prove to be uh, be sensitive to this. Um, I worry that the town hasn't really uh, reckoned with. This is just personal. I don't know if it's true, but I don't. I'm, I worry the town hasn't reckoned with the fact that uh, this might be the financial magnitude, more or less, of the high school, but for a smaller number of students. But and that's fine too, given the fact that we're buying something different. We're buying a, a team concept configuration. Uh, but the fact that we don't have Carlisle uh, in the game with us or MSBA in the game with us will be something that Concord's going to have to reckon with. Um, but, you know, it's uh, it, this is a once in a lifetime, so we've, we've got to get it right for the town. Um, if I may just add, um, echo those sentiments also to um, encourage uh, CMSBC to stay within that um, $100 million. I'm thinking about it, um, looking at it from the perspective of um, the need that there is in town, that um, we need to be sensitive to the current economic uh, situation of families. Uh, there is, you know, I, I, I'm involved with a lot of the non-profit organizations that in, in town in Concord and Carlisle, and there is a need. Uh, yes, we are raising, uh, we're still raising our uh, taxes as we did before for um, COVID, but a lot of families are struggling while they are paying their taxes. Uh, they are having trouble you know, putting food on the table and paying other bills. I, so I do want to be sensitive to that. And um, I appreciate that the, the committee uh, is, is working to uh, stay within that range, um, again, out of uh, consideration for the other needs that the families are having to face. Thank you. Other questions? Um, I have a question for you, Kristen. Um, uh, what's the likelihood that the, uh, the, and I know this is just a guess on your part, but what's the likelihood that the, uh, the siting of the building and the way it's amassed is gonna remain the same? Uh, for example, I know that, uh, just one example, if the department, if the fire department had their choice, they'd have access to the back of the building and they're not going to have access to the back of the building. Now that's just, you know, I'm picking that at random, but uh, uh, I, I don't know what the different factors are that might, and maybe you don't either, that might uh, necessitate uh, further changes away from treetops. Um, what's your sense about that? And what's your experience about that kind of question with a design at this stage of the game? Um, so I think that we did a lot of good work uh, understanding what uh, desirable adjacencies there were and, and organizationally how um, the school reacted to the four concepts that were presented last year. And so the design team does not plan on starting over with that, but learning from that and continuing. So they did, uh, they will be using treetop teams as a basis to see how that can evolve and be transformed with the new program, just because, again, we got the best feedback on that one and it was received well by the DSC and, and the school department at the time. Um, Introducing an auditorium to the scope, which wasn't part of it before, is a very different component. So that will uh, create some shifts. Um, I think that you know the the team continues to aspire to uh, make the floor plan more compact and reduce perimeter wall area and things like that, because we know your energy goals and those kind of things have an effect both on cost and energy. So I think that. Schematic design will continue to refine and, and look at all of those pieces, and we look forward to bringing them. Good. Thank you. That's helpful. Actually, Court, I should add, um, we, we find the fire department, the fire department is always so critical to these pieces in this conversation that um, before we even started programming, we had a touch base with them to make sure that the general siting would be acceptable. Right. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I know you did. Thank you. But thank you for pointing that out. Um, any questions for uh, Phil or uh, Kristen or Laurie about uh, teams, uh, about education plan and how it relates to the building or anything else? I'm just teasing this out of folks. This is our chance um, to weigh in at this stage. I did have a question about the alternate PE space. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little confused. It's sort of migrated a bit. <laughs> Um, what's the uh, intention? And um, I don't really understand the concept of a, 
the students from leaving their class and going someplace else. Oh, I think, yeah, I think we just need to communicate. I did talk on this at the design meeting last week, I think probably in the best way I had so far. Um, it does, it will serve as a space that the gym teachers can break off and have kids um, have alternate activities to PE. Um, they will still need to be supervised. That's no question. They may not all go down. They may not go down there by themselves. They may have a, you know, a group of them go down and gym is often two teachers in the big gym. So there's some flexibility there as well, but it will give us more, more options for PE than just being in the gym. In addition, um, it's a critical space. We did reduce the OTPT space. So now OTPT will need to be part of that as well as allow for um, the special education classrooms that are our more intensive rooms, um, movement space for them to have breaks and also any incentives, those kinds of, of things to spread out. So it's a, it's a flex space um, by nature, but it also allows for a lot of these spaces um, to be able to overflow in there and you know, have alternate activities that they wouldn't have any other, um, you know, a, a, any other environment that would be appropriate for them. I think that's probably one of the bigger key pieces. And additionally, after school, um, extracurriculars and in our in, you know, sports programs in the afternoon, um, basketball is very highly um, attended and participated at the middle school. So if we wanted to run any other kind of physical oriented space, that would be a perfect spot for a yoga class and some extracurriculars like that as well. So um, I hope that helps, Cynthia. Yeah, um, the only thing I would say is that working in a school, uh, from uh, the PE programs much prefer to be outside if possible. Mm -hmm. And that is a really nice site <laughs> to be outside. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I would encourage, strongly encourage you to, to focus on uh, outside programs and opportunities, especially as we've seen in COVID that mm -hmm. I, I could just see in my school that kids are so happy to be outside yeah. as much as they can possibly be. So P is one of those opportunities that um, they can get outside. And again, it's, we're lucky to have such a nice site. I mean, it's one of the, the best with the rail trail behind there. And it's just, it's a really good resource. So. Yeah. Great points. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, Cynthia, that reminds me, I mean, there's so many themes that have come in on public feedback, but one of the big ones in multiple instances has been please leverage the outdoors here and not just for gym, you know, classroom space, access to outdoors, all of that. And that's something that I think everybody on the building committee has weighed in on and said, yes, we, we really do want to make that a priority. Um, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful site and we want to take advantage of that. We want to give outdoor access to kids um, and leverage it in whatever ways we can. So that is something that has definitely been a topic at building committee meetings and at discussions, which is great. Um, you know what, another one just, it, these are all making me things, think of things that I could have said, oh, and this and this and this. Um, there, there's so much to add. One other thing I do think I want to throw in just again, in terms of all the feedback that's coming in, um, we really are hearing it. We're certainly hearing feedback similar to what several of you have said about let's make sure this doesn't, you know, the price tag doesn't explode beyond where we want it to be. Um, I think we have also heard feedback on the flip side, um, people saying not make it explode, of course, but, you know, this, this is our chance. Let's make sure we don't shave it unnecessarily. We have one shot at this. Let's make sure we do what's right um, and don't, you know, cut off opportunities too early that maybe we'll regret not having later. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there too. Again, it's very high level, but those are the things that we're constantly trying to balance here in this process yeah i want to i want to bring it to uh, school budgets uh, for for a minute or two uh, i think this will go your way laurie um my math would suggest that to have clean teams times nine instead of our current uh if we were to look at this in an fte uh frame it means a net increase of about four is that is that ultimately what's going to happen so when we brought you the operating budget for this year, I don't, I hope you'll remember, and if not, I'm glad we're bringing it up. Um, we, and in, it was a lot of information, so hopefully I'm glad we're highlighting it. Um, we have this, we have the sixth grade clean team. I wish we'd find another word for it, but anyway, sixth grade teams, 
I call yeah. it intact. Yeah. Yeah, there we intact. That's good. Um, seventh grade actually went to that structure last year, and eighth grade is in the budget you're reviewing again tonight with Jared. Because prior to me and Justin, um, English and math had some additional FTEs put to them to reduce class size. Um, you have no need, there was never a need to increase there. Um, the science and social studies sections have been where we've needed to address a, um, any staffing needs. So it's been 0.8 of an FTE for science and a 0.8 for social studies for each team. So we are actually at a place where the eighth grade, if your budget um, goes through as you've been looking at it, would be, uh, allow us to have the 1.6 FTE we need. And then at least in terms of personnel, you'd have the teams in place and we could really start to build and use the time from now till the building to look at what that model and structure really means in terms of how kids and teachers interact, how planning and interdisciplinary can work um, and be in a really, um, really great place to maximize the space that then would really take those teams to the to the level in, in environment that they would thrive in. The limitation now, even with the personnel, which is incredibly beneficial, you can't you don't have the pods and the, you know, community space that the teams are centered right. around. So they're spread all through the school and the teachers share, but the share the kids, but the kids are just still traveling the entire, the entire building, which very much is, is not the model we're hoping for. So no student has a neighborhood yet. Right. Exactly. So the good news is you've been slowly building that that was part of Justin's vision pre, you know, to get to at least the structure of it, um, that he did it in a gradual way. And so there's no large operating increase coming. In fact, you have operating decreases coming as the building, you know, when it finally opens because of the redundancies in staff and um, utilities and some of the other operational costs. Would I be accurate in saying then that uh, with the FTE increases uh, in the fiscal 22 proposal, we are uh, staffed up for core teams uh, to satisfy 660 kids, uh, something like that? Yes. When yep. we open, um, is a is a projection of an average class size in the core classes of 18 reasonable? Uh, I, it's the goal and we'll have the staff to do it. Uh, we get a little, it's a little trickier in the Sanborn building just because of space and schedules, um, than it would be in what we're proposing. So that would be, that would be the goal and we'll have the staff to make that doable. Um, I wouldn't be able to say every section it'll be perfect, but yes. But that really points to, you know, dramatic changes in the life of a middle yeah. schooler yeah. From, uh, from now to then, because we've got uh, uh, more staff, smaller groups. Uh, the groups are organized very differently and they have physical yeah. space that uh, uh, follows the, the function that we want. Yes, um, correct. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, that's all I've got. Anybody else? Phil, we want to thank you. Kristen, certainly thank you. Peter, thank you. Uh, you've given up another night for the children of Concord. Thank you. Uh, Much appreciated. So we do, we do appreciate it. So I think we'll bring this part to a close and uh, let you good folks go home. Um, Zoom home. <laughs> we'll, do, we'll do court. Thank At you. least that's been a, yeah. a convenience. Yeah. <laughs> Easy commute. Have a safe trip. Yeah. <laughs> Take care. Take care. Bye bye. Thank Good you. night, guys. Thank Good night. You. Thank you, everybody. Um, and uh, Jared, we're going to turn to you for the uh, CPS budget uh, tonight's uh, piece of that. So we see it, but I think you might be on mute, Jared. Sorry about that, jeez. No problem, no problem, uh, thank you. So uh, 
like the high school, uh, good news with the Concord uh, budget, the, the FinCom uh, increased their guideline. So current, the current superintendent's uh, budget is $117,337 over the guideline. Um, we, and we have some suggestions on how to get to the guideline. And so I, just want to note, I, I, I just want to note that the implication in that statement is that uh, uh, w without even waiting for the school committee, you're assuming we want to see this. And I want to thank you for that. Um, it speaks to what Heather said earlier about the relationship that we and the FinCom are trying to strike as best we can, notwithstanding the fact that our eye is on uh, uh, the service to kids first. Um, but thank you. Thank you for getting this ready. Um, so uh, we have some recommendations on how to potentially get to the guideline. Um, we currently have a, a projected vacancy uh, at the middle school in Spanish uh, due to a retirement. We budgeted that at 75,000. Um, in the last 48 hours, um, we spoke to the principal at the, uh, at the middle school and we think based on the fifth grade, numbers coming in for Spanish that he can do um, this with a 0.6. Therefore, there would be a $30,000 savings. So if we applied that $30,000 savings uh, to um, our other suggestion, which is very similar to, um, to the high school, I do anticipate to uh, have a max circuit breaker carryover for FY21 uh, at the end of FY21. We um, hopefully still sh should still be able to do some prepaying. And again, the way that we do budget, we do have um, some contingency in there based on um, uh, what we call potential out of district placements. And we feel that we can reduce the non-public tuition line by 87,000 uh, and get to the guideline and still um, have a comfortable contingency if uh, something should happen uh, unbudgeted. Uh, can, I, can I speak to this one? Uh, Lori, I imagine this is for you. Is the, uh, is the point 0.6 probably a one-year phenomena? And uh, if so, do we make our lives difficult by hiring a, a point 0.6 when we could hire a more capable 1.0 and anticipate uh, needs a year out? Um, that's a great question. We've actually been really pleased with, sometimes surprisingly pleased with the uh, level of caliber of people looking for part-time. Um, so I think it's a valid question. It was, we put the, you know, put the posting out and see what we have for a response. I guess it's no surprise to you in a zero-based budgeting environment, uh, the administrators don't really budget for, you know, sections they don't have because we don't let them do that. So it's a good question and one, you know, are we in any way penny wise and pound foolish as we look at who's available is a, is a, is a, is a thoughtful thought mm -hmm. for sure. What's the Spanish FTE at the present time? Do you have it handy, Jerry? I do. Uh, it is um, 10 seconds, I'll get that. Take your time. It's been quite high. We've been running lower numbers in French than mm -hmm. we've been rolling. I, I wouldn't want to say what they were, but definitely we've seen Spanish draw most of the, many, many of the kids. So I'm curious that, you know, maybe we're getting a little shift in that coming out of the fifth grade. Yeah. I actually just, I'm sorry, I just have a right. you, you got, you got, uh, you got a thousand You've got 1,000 lines of detail there. Maybe you can come back to us with that. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's going to change anything, but I'd, I'd simply like to know. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Other questions, comments about the CPS budget? And that would include last week's uh, uh, material as well. Oh, I would just have similar comments about the hardware. Um, in a particular, since we purchased to go to one-to-one -one at our K-5, how will we then eventually reallocate those? Are we, you know, I just would like to see. Yes. 
that. And, you know, the same thing, when are we going to have new leases uh, and so forth? <laughs> the other thing is, um, you know, I just had a brief uh, sort of email thread with Jared and Kristen, and I'm just wondering, are we absolutely um, finding economies of scale versus having departments purchase software on their own, site licenses? Correct. We often negotiate, you know, you're, you're quite willing to negotiate most companies um, who have a large you know, software base like um, Screencastify or whatever. Um, and similar to Alexa, I, you know, I wonder if we just really focus on trying to get kids off of screens as much as possible. Uh, yeah, so, uh, I, <laughs> well, and I'll, I'll tip my hat here a little to what's coming to you later in the week and Tuesday. Um, as we bring the K-5 kids back, we're not going to send the laptops home anymore. We agree with that completely. Um, so we're going to, we're all working in that same direction. And you're right about scale and cost. And that was one of the big drivers to centralize it. So we don't have, you know, if you do all these smaller subscriptions, you do pay more, no question. Yes. So you're right on all counts. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Just to add on that really quickly. Um, we're going to do most of our bidding in, in probably June, July. And the, most of these quotes are only good for 30 days. Um, and just like the zero base, uh, zero base budget process, we are going to continue to get better on this and all the software. So right now we just took the list from everyone. They were vetted, but they're going to continue to be vetted, uh, by, um, by Kristen and her staff. And the ones that we will bidding uh, bidding out will probably be less than the hundred and thirteen or so that I brought you. Um, yeah, so I agree. we'll keep getting better on that. That's good. I think we've got to build a plan to uh, really really make it stick this time. Uh, you know, Laurie's been here four years. Jared, you uh, about the same. Um, we, we've had these efforts come and go over the decades in this district, um, and. Uh, if, if, if you can build it to last, this, this system where the, the needs get voiced from the buildings and the classes, but then the purchasing happens in an aggregated way, then, then, then we're looking pretty smart. Yeah, and, and you all know this, right? The marketers are really good at their jobs and they you know, give teachers access for free. Right. Oh, yes. Till it's till they have something they can't do unless it's paid for. And, you know, we just a lot like we've done with all the other purchasing. We've now shifted the messaging of don't assume you're going to get to the paid subscription anymore. And I think when it was really at the department and building level, there was just a lot that would naturally morph. And I think, you know, a, a new message and a new process, it, it's going to get better for sure. And, you know, you can, you know, sometimes it'll escalate. 100%, you know, 100%, and we'll say, you know what, we're going to go find something else. And there's so many products out there right yeah, now. Right. That it's, is also part of why that list is so huge, because it, right. there's so much out there. Yeah. But, but the one thing I know you understand is that you, you have to be strategic, because you often need to provide PD. And uh, so to jump around a lot, uh, leaves a person who's invested in something, <laughs> and then you right. have to switch them off. But for the most part, it does work. Um, yeah. yeah, and you know, we're, we're, I think I'll name you know, and we'll have more and more of this conversation. We don't want, I mean, for kids to navigate the number of platforms you're seeing in these lists is ex is extraordinary and overwhelming. So we also need to keep their needs in mind and the the challenges of switching all the time and how we centralize that. I will, and we'll say that's another big goal for us. And, and some of these products are for teachers to improve their pedagogy. So it's not necessarily kids who are in front of screens, and that might be important to designate which is which. Yeah, great point, Cynthia. Yeah. And the consumerism idea for the teachers, that applies for the kids too. So we talk often about the, the distraction that uh, the screens and the internet cause. But uh, another major concern is the, the consumerism, right? The, 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 they are offered all these freebies and then they get they become addicted to buying and having these things that often don't have a lot of value really. Uh, so that's another concern. And thank you for think, thinking about this. Any other comments? Jared, thank you. Thank you very much. 
Laurie, thank you. No, um, thank you. You've covered a lot tonight. Um, when we move to uh, go to executive session for the Concord Public Schools School Committee, uh, I will note that uh, the executive session uh, earlier this evening, in fact, did not adjourn. So we'll simply be resuming, but uh, for clarity uh, in the public eye, uh, know that uh, the Concord School Committee will enter into executive session under purpose three of the open meeting law to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining and litigation. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and not return to open session. Would there be a motion to that effect, please? So moved. Thank you. And a second, please. Second. And uh, those in favor, roll call. Anderson, aye. And Booth, aye. Aye. Yes, Judge, aye. Rainy, aye. And that does it. And that's de facto our adjournment for tonight because we've just sent ourselves to executive session. So thank you all for joining us. And uh, we are uh, meeting next week. And uh, just to note publicly, uh, we, uh, sorry, uh, friends and colleagues, uh, we expect to meet on March 16th as well, as far as we know. We're getting into the busy patch sooner than we thought we would. Yep. Okay. All right. Good night, all, and yep. we'll see you in exec.